Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to the Gordon Institute of Business Science and uh, the Business Education Mini Jam here in Johannesburg. And the idea is that we will be having this Business Education Mini Jam um, for Africa. Um, I'll introduce myself first, and then I will ask my uh, fellow manalist. <laughs> Uh, because if we, if we had females on the panel, it would be called a panelist. And in due course, we will obviously address the gender inequality in society. My name is Morris Mtombeni. I'm a director here at Gibbs in charge of faculty. And I operate at the intersection of academia and practice. And I will be your co-host this afternoon as we kick off uh, the Africa Jam 2017. I hand you over to Professor Howard Thomas to introduce himself. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. It's, uh, it's great to see you here. Uh, great to be here. Um, I actually flew in from London this morning, so um, with my gray hair, God only knows how I'm standing up, but there we are, or sitting down or whatever I'm doing. So a uh, great welcome to you all. Um, the uh, name tag on there says Professor Howard Thomas, Boston University. That's true, but only partially true. I'm also a professor in Singapore Management University, which is in Singapore, um, and is a university which has about the same life cycle as Gibbs does as a business school. I believe Gibbs started in 2000, is that correct? Yes. Um, well, SMU started in 2000 in Singapore as a new uh, management university in the social sciences. So I've actually uh, been in Singapore Management University the last uh, eight or nine years, uh, close to six of those as dean of the business school. For my last time, thank God, I've been a dean four times. Um, that's why I've got gray hair. Um, but uh, the purpose of me being here with uh, Morris is for us to extend uh, the notion of a business education jam, which essentially started um, when I was working and have been working for a long time at BU. And um, we got a number of corporate sponsors in the United States, as well as AACSB and GMAC and, and uh, EFMD to sponsor a business education jam, which was actually a real time um, uh, uh, e, e, e facilitated conversation across every single continent in the world. So for 60 hours in September, October 2014, uh, we ran a continuous um, mini jam to take into account all the different time zones in the world and make sure everybody had an opportunity to talk. So we had uh, well over 6,000, around 6,000 registrants. Um, we had uh, many more conversations, and we summarized those into a book which was published in 2016. Uh, I was one of the co-authors of that book. But one of the things that came out from that book, which I think is tremendously important, is that in that conversation, most of the people who talked were from the West. So, you know, in no particular order, but the North Americans were perhaps the most vociferous closely followed by the Canadians, then quickly followed by the Brits and many other Europeans. The Asians came in latterly, uh, as did the Latin Americans, and we didn't get as many African voices as we wanted. And so the purpose of the mini jams now, over the next 18 months, is to hold these mini jams uh, across the globe, but with a more focused conversation and trying to establish um, comments from the broadest set of people in each of those locales that we can. So the way this, this uh, mini jam is structured, it's structured in a way that it is actually a, a course on edX at the same time as having a um, live version of it in the room here today. 
So people who log on to this course from anywhere in Africa can take part in the course, can see the video streaming, um, can, can then answer the questions that we pose themselves um, uh, in terms of an email conversation, which we will record and try and do the best we can to make sense of this jam. And so it's not just going to be in Africa. We are planning jams in, in Singapore before I leave SMU, which in fact I am going to do around about Easter next year, and I'll be doing it before then. One in Instituto de Impresa in Western Europe. One in uh, VEU, which is the Wirtschaftsuniversität Wien in, in Vienna in September. One in Xinhua in China in June, and we have others scheduled for India and a number of other places over the course of 2018. What we're hoping to do in 2019 in the uh, uh, round about the middle of 2019 is have a global jam in Boston where we will invite the facilitators and certain participants from each of the jams to come to Boston and we will have uh, an even bigger dialogue and discussion but in real time in that room again with the same format of video streaming and with uh, the ability to of people to uh, to, to uh, push forward. Um, I can see one or two faces in the room that I uh, yeah, familiar um, with? know very well. Jonathan <laughs> Cook, for example, who was uh, very much uh, um, uh, instrumental, I think, in many ways, in me getting interested in Africa, uh, given the, his work with the African Management Institute. Um, and I always wanted to visit Africa, but I did three deanships in a row for 26 years from uh, 1990, and so I really was running out of time, but then I got some grants from GMAC, EFMD, and a a a AACSB to carry on this work, and BU are supporting it. So I'm carrying on, and <laughs> we're going to hopefully get this conversation even more strongly. We're hopefully going to, I think, have a conversation which is really about the issues that are important in management education, in particular. Um, you know, my wife, who, who is here, but uh, um, will be at the conference that follows this, uh, uh, um, this uh, mini jam. She has a word which I, I know that uh, Jonathan Cook shares because they, they were discussing it when we were in Lagos not long ago. Uh, when you're looking at management education, the most important phrase is the meaning of context, culture, and country. So that when people talk about is there an European management education model or an African management education model or an American management education model? Um, I think in many ways, if you have lived and worked in those countries, and sadly in my life I've been a dean on four continents, I've worked on in most of them, and it's absolutely clear that countries uh, are different, that business schools are different, and geographies, context, culture, and meaning are related to those countries. And if you do not understand that, and if you do not work through that as a, uh, as a working proposition, you will make many mistakes in terms of uh, getting the right management education curricula and the right management education models. So that's a long-winded introduction. That's lovely. Um, but I would say that uh, my wife and I have been together for 45 years, but for the last 10 years she's been writing with me. Um, that could have been a recipe for divorce, but actually, <laughs> actually it's been good fun. <laughs> so uh, I can recommend it to other people who, uh, who might wish to work with their partners in the, in the, in the, in the gray-haired version of their life. But uh, uh, it's been very re rewarding simply because she comes from a different tradition than I do in terms of academic life. Uh, she's a psychologist and, and has much more of a, an interpretive lens on the way the world works. So I'll stop there. Well, thank you. Great introduction. And we're very privileged to have you here, Howard, um, uh, to have somebody of your experience, uh, not only as somebody who is a scholar of business education, but as well as a scholar of business across many contexts. Not to be uh, uh, accused of being Luddites, I would really like to point out that if you're really interested, you could also tweet some comments about the jam and uh, the, the, the Twitter handle is uh, hashtag Africa Jam. 
capital A, capital J, and uh, you're welcome to incorporate more people into the conversation beyond edX platform as also beyond this conversation in the classroom. So, so that people know the, the program of how we're going to have the conversation today, um, I just want to just put it, put it in context. I'm going to invite Howard to give us some background of what is a business education jam, where did it come from, what are the key highlights of the original jam, and um, having done that, I will then pose some provocations, some questions, and encourage the people in the room to then make a contribution. Um, and those that wish to online, you're also welcome to, but I imagine it will be easier for us to have the conversation in the room and stream that out. And so we will be dipping in to the conversation into the room, and then Howard and I will be having conversation largely through um, some of the, 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 the slide deck that he will help us to have that conversation, and then I'll provoke the, 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 the room into giving us a contribution as well. Are we comfortable with that? Great. Howard, you're on. Okay, well, there are slides, <laughs> um, but, you know, like everything else, I don't wish to indulge in the, in, the, in the form of death by PowerPoint that can occur if you have too many slides. So what I'm going to do is I've, I've edited it down to a set of slides which I think uh, give us the kernel of what we're trying to achieve, and then from there I'll try and give you some background before we start on... Uh, the, the three sections of our debate today. Um, so, um, our work all started with, uh, with uh, a question, will business education remain relevant? Well, you know, uh, yesterday, I think it was yesterday, but at 9 o'clock in the morning, I gave a keynote address to, on the 25th anniversary of the Chartered Association of Business Schools in in the UK in the Birmingham Conference Center yesterday. Um, and one of the questions they were asking is, is our research relevant and is what we do relevant? So I don't think this question has gone away. In fact, it, uh, it lingers the whole time when governments start worrying about, well, is the research you do uh, meaningful and relevant to your constituencies? And of course, your constituencies in a business school are constituencies of business government and civil society, and not simply business. So many of the conversations that have had been had before, I think, have veered more towards a business audience, not taken into account uh, the other two main audiences. I mean, you, have, you can look at many Western societies, Brit Britain is a good example, where many, many people are employed by the public sector. So the question of relevance is a question that extends simply beyond relevance to a business audience, but rele relevant uh, to government and to civil society, and to questions that we should be asking, questions about inclusive growth and how we bring into um, uh, the ambit and bring into the educational domain people who find it difficult to gain access uh, because of the affordability of that education and because of the lack of equality. And that's a lack of equality in Western countries just as much as it is in uh, African and emerging market countries. Uh, you know, I am very, very clear that there's a huge gulf between wealth and poverty in very many countries. And I think when we talk about relevance, we should, uh, should we talk about relevance in terms of those three constituencies. Um, here's a business, qu a business quote, though. This is a quote which says that 96% of chief academic officers in universities say their institution is somewhat or very effective at preparing students for the world of work. And the disconnect is uh, only 33% of business leaders agree or strongly agree that graduates have the knowledge that business needs. Well, that's one huge gap. Um, these are Gallup polls. You can say, well, Gallup is not doing exactly what it should be doing, but quite frankly, the gap that exists is a real gap. And so the question that we're trying to attack is how we improve this. Now, when we started the jam in Boston, we actually surfed the literature and went through the literature on management education in detail and 
uh, people like Jonathan and others uh, in Africa and people in other parts of the world have written quite heavily on this subject. Uh, in particular, people like Henry Mintzberg, who's been a, you know, a constant critic of uh, MBA programs uh, ever since he got his uh, uh, PhD in MIT in 1976, is, is one of those people who's contributed to, the, to that debate. And what you see on that slide, and you'll see in the edX note as well, is a series of the uh, forum topics that we started off with in uh, the jam that we started off originally. Um, I'm not going to go through every single one of them, um, but you, know, you can very, very clearly see the, these are the kinds of issues that still maintain. Um, I was actually the forum leader for uh, Forum One, um, supporting 21st century competences, which was really a question and uh, a, a, a forum about what kinds of skills were appropriate in the 21st century. And of course, uh, the advent of the millennials and the rampant advent of the millennials since, since uh, we started doing that work has been absolutely clear uh, to the extent, for example, that BU has started up a master's program which actually is designed with millennials in mind and which is essentially three terms, a master's program with three terms, three projects, starts off with a small company, second one is a medium-sized company, and third is a large company. All the students work on projects with each of those companies. They have a little bit of a boot camp of management education and then they have a core faculty that they can tap to ask for information on topics they don't understand. And so they design their own learning as well as the learning being designed around projects. And that's an example, I think, of how to attack those kinds of competences that are necessary in the 21st century. I'm not going to read the rest. Um, you know, whenever, whenever I come to Africa, people always point out to me the question about ethical leadership. But quite frankly, there's a need for ethical leadership all over the world. Um, you know, I've flown out from London this morning. I mean, goodness only knows how they're going to handle uh, the, uh, the slee scandals that are going through every single political party in Britain at the moment and perhaps a, a lot of other places as well. Um, it could stretch to academia as well, as far as I can tell. And so, you know, when we talk about ethical leadership, this is not simply an emerging market problem. It's a problem that transcends almost every single society. And all, the others there you can, you can read in the edX notes, and I'm not going to read the slides uh, because I can hardly read them myself, actually. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> this is better. I can read this. This is the sort of typeface I can read. <laughs> but in any case, what emerged? Oh, I've pushed it on one too many. Um, wait a minute. There should be, yeah, there we go. There should be eight critical questions. These are the eight critical questions that emerged out of the first jam. Are there four in the next slide? And there are four in the next slide. <laughs> hey, you can see as a dean, I'm not as good as this guy <laughs> at presenting. So I'm taking all the tips I can get. <laughs> okay? You know, so keep going. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to read them. Let me just stress the words that are important in each of those slides. How can business e education enhance value for students, employees, and the world? So there isn't just personal value, there's social value and other value contexts as well. We're not just talking about a, uni a, uni a single form of value. How can management research that originates in, in business schools drive insights for industry? Well, you know, those of you who watched uh, Britain in the context of the research excellence framework and the, now the new knowledge excellence framework will understand that British universities are being charged by the government to, do, to define the impact that they're making on society, whether it's business, government, or civil society. And the words that come out very commonly in those kinds of debates are about co-creation of knowledge. Why aren't you doing research projects with management partners, be they in government, in industry, 
or in civil society. Why aren't you doing that kind of work so that you're co-creating knowledge that can be useful to all parties, not just to the business school academic seeking to publish it in an academic journal? How will technology continue to challenge management education? Well, that's very, a very, very interesting topic. Um, and you know, if you simply took Africa as a context of that, uh, in relation to that question, obviously the internet uh, uh, presence in Africa is not that great. But the mobile telephony presence in Africa is considerable. So the use of mobile telephones and mobile technology becomes tremendously important if you're going to use technology to, in fact, upskill and educate uh, people with management skills of, of appropriate kind. Uh, Jonathan Cook, in his own study in uh, 2013, uh, uh, um, estimated that there were up to uh, a, a significant number of people, well over the millions, who needed upskilling in management education. And this is one device by which th this could happen. But of course, you have to ask yourself the question, is technology cheap or is it a, a low cost alternative? And uh, I would remind a number of you who have a chance, uh, there's a book written by the, uh, the former dean of uh, IE University in Spain, but who is now president of IE University in, um, in, in Madrid, uh, a book written by him called The Learning Curve. And in that book, he describes how IE completely re-engineered some of its programs in order to take account of uh, uh, e-learning platforms. But the, one of the conclusions that I think is terribly important, you don't save any money. You know, people think it's low cost, it isn't because what you then have to do is use technology to substitute for the face-to-face -face component and therefore you have to have devices and train people, train the academics themselves to do that and that is not cost-free. However, places like Africa have a, a, a tremendous opportunity to you know, jump behind technologies like that and upgrade those technologies in a meaningful way. Accreditation and rankings are, uh, you know, depending on which way you went to look at it, tyrannical or wonderful. Uh, Rakesh Karana in his book describes the tyranny of the rankings. And the truth is, the rankings have completely changed the way the business schools operate. We talk about brands. We talk about marketing. I remember when I first went to London Business School, and this, I'm not going to tell you what year that was, but it was at the founding of London Business School, we never talked about brands. And we never talked about marketing and the managerialization of business schools that has taken place following the advent of the business school, business week rankings in 1987. A wind of change came across our, our industry. Maybe not to, to such a terrific wind of change. And the argument about accreditation is, yes, it increases standards, but it increases isomorphism and people mimicking everybody else. Instead of de defining a mechanism for generating management education that might be meaningful. So then, um, how can a academia and industry collaborate to ensure students develop critical leadership and management competences? That's a very, very interesting question to which I still don't have the answer. Um, I think that's a very, very difficult one. How will ind industry and business education tap the potential of millennials? You know, what is clear is it, and I was in this management education audience in Birmingham yesterday, what is clear when you look in the room that most of the deans there a white male with graying hair, in my case very gray hair, between 50 and upwards. There are relatively few female deans, many more in Britain now than there were 10 years ago, but probably no more than 20% and roughly about the same percentage 
in the United States. It might be 25% in the United States. But hardly any deans in the UK who come from minorities. Uh, and that, I think, is willful blindness in what we're doing in, in the management education field. How can ethical leadership be fostered across business, edu education, and industry? It's not good enough us giving our students the case on Enron and then telling them, well, what went wrong there and explain what went wrong and why you'd never do it yourself. The main players in Enron had MBAs from Harvard, Northwestern, and I'm not going to name the other schools. I taught in both of those. <laughs> um, and I could go down the list. So simply by writing out a 28-page case is not going to do anything other than you should be looking at the whistleblower in Arthur Anderson who blew the whistle on the Houston office that allowed all these strange um, accounting practices, off-balance sheet practices to occur in Enron. And it's a great book. I've, I've used the book in a course myself. The lady wrote a book, brought down Arthur Anderson in the process. So Arthur Anderson's reputation went south as a result of the Enron crisis. What I think we should be doing is putting young people or managers in situations where they confront ethical dilemmas in real time. In other words, you know, we've got a lot of game theorists around. Why can't we cre create game situations where your grade on a course will be dependent on whether you lie, cheat, or steal, or whether you behave ethically? You can get an A-plus if you lie, cheat, and steal, and you can get a B-minus if you behave ethically. Now, there's a choice that I think a lot of people would think about. And I think we have to put people into a situation where they confront those things. And finally, what role should business and industry play in developing the next generation of entrepreneurs and innovators? And everybody talks about entrepreneurship. Everybody talks about innovation nowadays. How do we do it? How do we generate those kinds of skills? How do we encourage people to become uh, entrepreneurs and then generate um, the African multinationals of the future, for example, in, in, in this context? Um, I'm not going to go through those charts. I think those are pretty evident from what I've said. As you can tell, I don't follow the script. Um, <laughs> But the, the one piece of the script I don't want to, do want to follow is there are three things that I think are really important when we look at business schools of the future. Value, and value is, has a component that I've, I've said is personal value. It might be business value. It might be social value. But value has multiple meanings. The second thing is real world relevance. And the third thing is differentiation. You know, I've always thought that you know, people talk about grand strategies for business schools and designing grand strategies. What about grand strategy that says, I am good at doing certain things and I'm going to make my damnedest to make sure that I do those things as well as I possibly can. In fact, in an excellent fashion so that the people who go out have a very warm feeling about what I'm doing. Not about extending my portfolio. Not about generating so much money that I become a cash cow for the president of the university, but doing the things that you're doing right and doing them extremely well. Now, I'm trying to be deliberately um, confrontational because this is what this kind of dialogue is about, um, to get you to think. And so now, having hopefully warmed you up a little bit, I'm going to pass on to Excellent. Morris, who's, I think, going to pose certain questions to you and generate the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Howard, for uh, providing an excellent context and a provocation. Um, I read in the book that you referred to earlier, um, uh, following the Business Jam 2014, uh, one of the key insights was that this conversation really began not yesterday and not the day before, but properly in 1959, thanks to the big American foundations of Ford and is it Carnegie. Um, and in terms of how they shifted business education mm. from their vocational space mm. to the academic space. Mm. 
and, and online, there's one of the points made by Imad is that um, we need to really explore the adequacy of management education and business needs uh, in Africa as an important issue. So again, it's really linking us back to that conversation of uh, are we a vocational business or are we an, 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 institu an, an academic institution? And I suppose if you frame it that way, it becomes either or, and it's not really helpful. Mm. It's possibly more helpful to say we seek to be both, to be both practitioner focused and to have academic rigor. Mm. So I suppose jumping from, um, uh, from Imad, I would like to also take a leave from Tammy online who's asking for to learn from the community in the room. And I would like to then ask the community in the room to perhaps reflect on what skills will business schools of today and tomorrow require in a digitized world. So really, we, we are seeing in increasing demand for digitization. Uh, when you listen to the people that really understand digitization, uh, understand one of the statistics is that uh, the digital revolution will contribute over 15 trillion US dollars in the next 20 years into the global economy. So we then really need to understand what is our role as business schools or business educators in that conversation, in that transformation that's going to happen. So I throw this out at, at the floor, is what skills do we need today and tomorrow to become relevant in a digitized world? There we go. And, and what we're oh sorry thank you um in terms of the trends and the things that you've you've picked up and what you've touched on especially in a digitized world going forward i know one of the areas that we've started looking at is being more open to being kind of content agnostic so you know most individuals can find the content and i think the masters you refer to that you know they can draw on their own resources is a great way of creating their and crafting their own learning journey but I think one of the skills that business schools has not invested on enough is instead of content then, how do we help people assimilate the amount of information and help them make better decisions with that information? I think that we're currently very skilled in the content and, and driven towards the academia and our rankings, as you pointed out. But that idea of how do we equip people to be better at the, at the internal, the functional, almost cognitive elements. Um, I think it's quite important, and I would love to hear more about how you at you know, the various universities that you've worked with have potentially worked that into curriculum or design in any elements. Thank you. I think you can answer that, but I also would like to propose as we go forward, and thank you for that, Daniela, um, is not everything has to be a question. You can also make a contribution and, <laughs> and, and say, this is what I think, right? But that was fully directed at you, Howard. <laughs> well, it, it sounded to me like it was. <laughs> so let me give you two examples. Um, one of which is I think we, do, we don't focus enough on what I call the mind of the strategist. So in other words, everybody says, you know, somehow or other, you know, going back and looking at, for example, Steve Jobs, which I, you know, everybody knows. And everybody says, well, how on earth did he get the idea of moving from computers into you know, everything else he moved into, music devices and all the way along, mobile phones and everything else, and thereby redefined a whole number of industries. And you have to turn around and you ask yourself the question, well, is the strategist about grand designs, or is the strategist about going back to the point I was making before, doing things well and knowing what you're doing well and doing them really well? Now, those are two different and polar v viewpoints about what strategy is about. But honestly, one way that I have found of getting to your point is project-based courses. So I gave you the example of the one in Questrom. But you know, even as a dean for the last 30 years, I've been teaching a course every year, which is a project-based course, which is actually I get a client. 
um, you know, and uh, in the last five years in Singapore, it's been Johnson and Johnson, Phillips, Merck, and so on, and they give me a project in a given area. And what I do is to take the students through to solve the multiple problems that are in there. And one of the things that are, you know, and this gets back to your content point, one of the things that we don't teach well is what Russell Ackoff described as the error of the third kind, which is solving the wrong problem. So you get the students to look at the projects, and they come up with it. Uh, the first thing that I get them to do is to go and look at the problem, define it, and make sense of that problem. And, you know, half of them, and we, I split them up into six different project groups, half of them screw it up completely, and the other half are in need of remedy and attention. And so, you know, it's split up in effect to saying, solve the wrong problem, and you're wasting your time on data analysis, and you're wasting your time and looking at the nature of the organization in order to implement whatever solution you have. And this, this comes back to having a proper debate about where learning takes place. I mean, you know, the, a Mintzberg definition of strategy is strategy is the path in the stream of decisions and actions, and strategy is a set of options. It's never cast in stone. There are a lot of books who cast it in stone. You know, I have a, a strategy textbook, which I was proud of when I wrote it. It's 701 pages. Ask a millennial to read 701 pages, and they'll say, forget it. You know, one student uh, said to me the other day, why can't you devise cases which are three to five pages long that I can read on my tablet? And so on and so forth. So what I'm saying is, we have to look very closely at the nature of how problems are defined, and also have a look at the way millennials work. I mean, I have four sons. They regard me as a complete te technological dinosaur, and they're right, I am. But understanding how people learn and understanding how we move that forward is going to solve uh, that content problem much better. I think we are content-driven, by the way, and I agree with you. But I'm going to stop there because... So I'm going to suggest a process for a jam uh, which is we are all jamming and improvising as we go along. So just to get the, the gray matter going in the room, I'm going to say do a buzz group for 30 seconds. In each buzz group, I'm expecting at least one idea in terms of the kind of skills that business needs today or tomorrow for uh, in a globalized digital economy. Right? Quick 30-second buzz group, and those online can go run to their room quickly to the kitchen and grab some water or some coke and uh, we'll be back in 30 seconds. <laughs> a good idea. Because otherwise they start asking me questions. Yes, I want them to answer the yeah, questions. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> uh, there's no point in me answering the <laughs> question. I mean, I can do that standing on my <laughs> head, but that's that probably not. Well, 74 hasn't materialized, has <laughs> it? No. I wonder what. That's why I worried about that list when I saw the two lists. I wondered what it meant. Perhaps the others are online. Yeah. yeah. Okay, if I can bring you back. Thank you. We're starting. So, Howard, we have a habit here. Um, when we be, before we begin speaking, we like to spend time introducing each other to each other. So that was a bit of a test. Uh, it said 30 seconds. I was trying to take out the introductions out of the equation, but I noticed some of the people in the room spent half of that 30 seconds introducing each other. But we will catch up. We will catch up. Maybe we can kick off with you, Adrian, because I saw there was a lot of activity happening there between you and Haley. Um,
Yes, we definitely need the mic. Um, so we had two, there were two points. Uh, the one was around actually uh, extending on Danielle over this uh, discussion about content was more a question. And the question was, was if, if it is, if content becomes more and more accessible uh, and business schools are about content, then how relevant is a business school? So that was, uh, was just a provocation. Okay. And then the second uh, comment, I guess, or contribution was, was in a digital society, jobs are changing more and more frequently. I know with my children, who are sort of in their early teens, I would far rather they learn how to change. I'm expecting that they're going to go through three or four types of jobs uh, during their career, and there's a fairly good chance that my children are going to outlive current retirement by 20, 30, 40 years as, as prosthetics and medicines get more advanced. So, so it's, uh, a lot of it to me is about resilience and the ability to change your job three or four times instead of just the one midlife crisis that we have at the moment. So, okay, thank great. You. Yeah. Thank you. Udo. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, Professor Howard and Morris for a great panel. We didn't have the time to really discuss. We ended up introducing ourselves to each other. Um, <laughs> but also, I feel that business schools and business management schools of today um, really do need a huge skill when it comes to breaking down theoretical concepts into practical frameworks that the industry can make use of. We are currently sitting in a situation where we are very much up there dealing with the theories and industry does not know how to relate in terms of you know the theoretical concepts that we bring out and also business schools and scholars in general we do not actually have a way of bringing it down to frameworks and action plans that they can use and say, okay, this is how it is, this is the theory, but this is the practical way we can go about it and make full use, or make full, um, you know, use of the theories. So that's one particular place I believe we need to really up our game um, within business schools. So it's not just about the case studies, and as Professor Howard mentioned, um, having case studies, but they're not relevant in terms of dealing with practical issues that we need uh, within the industry. I think that's one area that we need skills in. Oh, wonderful. So maybe we can switch to the other side. Uh, Mapilo, over there. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Prof. Howard and uh, Morris. Um, I think. Okay. Um, from our side, um, basically the question uh, that I think was on my mind was um, when we, tra w well, those business schools, when they train people, what kind of a, um, a worker they will be managing in the digital age and what sort of things that go to there, they will have to relook at their curriculum going forward and make sure that it's compatible with the kind of worker that they will be managing because it will go to uh, how they look at incentivizing. I mean, somebody has just made a point now that um, the workers now probably change jobs more than four times. Um, the things that um, are done by companies today to keep employees, uh, they no longer are the things that work. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe if I could ask, bring in another practitioner, Sanjeev, and ask you to reflect because we I hear th hearing some business school perspectives, and it's also useful. Thank you, Mapila, giving us a practitioner perspective, and it would be helpful to hear your views, Sanjeev. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so, so we discussed a few points, uh, like, you know, what other things, like, you know, if, if from the points point of view, agility, change management, how to effectively manage the change continuously. Okay, those are the things, like, you know, the business schools has to have as part of the curriculum. but. On the hindsight, but they're saying, okay, so we, we are talking about the longevity of business school existence, okay? So we are saying, okay, this is, these are the things which has worked in past, and then we say, okay, this is a case study, and that's how we teach. But if the things of past is working perfectly fine, mm. then that's not a measurement for the future. 
So then there's no disruption is required. So how to create an environment so that you are creating a challengers who can challenge the existing view. And that's how the disruption can be controlled and a disruption can be you know, uh, awarded and uh, new business things can be evolved. So these are the few things which I believe should be on the, on the platter, how, how to create that kind of environment where we are encouraging the challenging behavior and you know, so we, we can create an environment where like, you know, we can have the disruptions uh, you know, handled impact, uh, effectively. Wonderful. So just to summarize, it sounds to me, it, it sounds to me that um, there's a great need for h enabling students, uh, learners today, tomorrow, to focus on the ability to deal with change, to be agile, and to deal with disruption, right? And uh, Charlene, perhaps instead of answering this specific question, I'm gonna ask you to reflect on the next question, which is how should the business or management schools position themselves uh, for this uh, environment of disruption, this environment of change that demands agility? Should I answer that without us discussing it Without first? any discussion. You are now required to be agile. Uh, yeah, okay. and, and <laughs> uh, so I, th I think in, in our EFM, EFMD conference that follows on this, we'll have this theme in as well, which deals with, uh, with uh, dynamic capability. And if we can develop dynamic capability within our students, we can help them to adjust to change, be ready for the disruptions, whether it's artificial intelligence or whatever is coming. Um, and so what does that mean for so operating in an African context? So what is the dynamic I capability? May, I just want to continue that thought yeah. as uh, Lerato was saying, uh, learning to learn. So I think that's one of the most important things we can do. It's not so much about the content, but if we can instill that skill to be able to think and to learn within our students, that, that's what we need to do. Um, in the African context, it's the same as elsewhere. Africa is just increasingly more complex or, or dramatically more complex than other contexts, uh, I think. Um, and so we need that ability to be adaptive a lot more in this context uh, than elsewhere. But it's similar all over the world. Everybody needs to be uh, able to adjust, and that's the skill we need to instill in our students, my view. Oh, thank you. So uh, as I, before I hand over to you, so I'd like to acknowledge the contribution from Imad who said in the digital world, business schools also need to promote skills like lifelong learning, which is really an echo of the point that uh, you, Charlene, and Lerato were making about learning to learn. It's really then a tilt to um, uh, Mr. Toffler, who was talking about the literate of the future, those that, that, that cannot uh, read or write, but more are the ones that cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn, right? Um, Professor Howard, I hand over to you to continue perhaps with the master class and then we'll bring the conversation back into plenary. Okay, maybe if just before I go on to, go on to the um, uh, second topic, um, I was really taken by Sanjeev's comment actually about uh, case studies. You know, and, and in many ways, you know, this is, a, this is an issue that uh, is really quite important. I mean, most of those case studies, what, what we're telling you about is how clever Steve Jobs was in finding the I iPad or Canon was in finding something else. And, you know, it's, it's like looking at driving forwards through a rear view mirror. And in a certain sense, what, what I think a, a number of you are asking for is, you know, whether it's the skills of agility, resilience, or whatever it is, the ability to also take a few risks as well. Um, and, you know, we're, as academics, we're pretty poor at dissemin disseminating our information uh, elsewhere, largely because of the reward systems that exist in universities. Uh, it's much easier to publish in academic journals than it is in uh, uh, disseminating our, our, our information to the audiences that really need it. So, you know, as physician, heal, th heal thyself as well. So we've got an awful lot to worry about. So uh, uh, with that transition, if you allow me to just make a few comments on yes. I will now um, transition and explain how the, uh, you know, those of you who probably 
got on the um, um, jam uh, feed, um, it were only went live last night. So some of you have not read uh, one or two of the bits that are on the online course. Um, and uh, for that, uh, you know, I apologize. But nevertheless, what I'd like to do is just to give you a synthesis. There is an article in the edX uh, outline um, which comes under the topic of uh, understanding business education in Africa. I'm sure I'm in the room. I'm talking to people who know probably more about it than I do. But nevertheless, um, I'm dangerous in the sense that I've written two books on it. And I spent two and a half years probably working on it uh, after, the, after giving up as a dean. So I'm dangerously uh, um, interesting. Let's put it that way. So the background information is that this is a huge continent. You know, 54 countries, very different educational systems. Even South Africa, where we're sitting now, has a high school graduation rate, which is uh, not necessarily uh, uh, something to be hugely proud of. Um, in t and you can find other countries in Africa which have much higher uh, uh, graduation rates. But nevertheless, we have an issue of you know, um, the history of Africa. And certainly I, as a, uh, as a, a Welshman, you know, can in part apologize for the efforts of many uh, colonial powers here in Africa over uh, a generation or two in establishing uh, certain uh, things in the context of Africa. Some, some educational systems work extremely well, some don't. Uh, the, system, the system is everybody's out there to play. Everybody wants success. And what you see in the African context when you go around to the different countries is that people have a hunger for learning. And I will reinforce this point as many times as I have to today. There's inequality in access, in affordability, and there is an issue, um, just as much as there's an issue in other markets of the world, but an even stronger issue here. There's a hunger for learning and a desire for people to uh, improve their lot. And I think that's true across Africa, whether, you know, as well as in South Africa. I asked the question several times in the, t in the two or three readings you have in the edX course, is an African model of education realistic? And, you know, the, the question that I posed very early on in our discussions was, and I quoted my wife's phrase, there is no meaning without context, culture, and country. So contextualizing education is terribly important. Not all parts of South Africa are the same as other parts of South Africa. I mean, I know it from rugby. Um, uh, you know, there are different parts of, uh, of South Africa and different uh, uh, areas where different traditions exist. And you may wish to be a regional school or attack uh, environments that exist there. Um, and I was actually just uh, noticing that a colleague of mine from Boston University, Paul Carlisle, um, has just come up on, on the um, Twitter feed and said, Paul Carlisle, and he says, I love the point about learning to learn. That is the heart of agile learning. I mean, he hasn't, the word learning isn't down there, but that's basically what he's saying. And of course, Paul is the architect of that MSMS program in, in, in BU that I was talking about before, which has, um, uh, you know, I think uh, um, a, a real genuine desire to design curricula with students instead of imposing curricula on students. Um, so a need to contextualize is management in universal context. Is it the same to manage in um, London, in Manchester, in Johannesburg, in Lagos, in Ghana? Well, that's a question that I think you need, to, you need to pose. Are there certain principles of management that are, are important uh, or, um, and uh, uh, you know, exist across those 
countries, contexts, and so on, or is, uh, uh, as I think Adrian pointed out earlier on, uh, the sense of uh, resilience, agility, um, the willingness to uh, operate through change, equally important in terms of the construct of what management has to be in it. You know, and I heard the word agility several times. Um, um, management education requires adaptation. Well, that rolls into the, is the Western model uh, dominant? Well, the answer to that is the Western model is dominant. Um, um, you know, Morris said very earlier on that uh, the current form of management education that exists in most countries of the world really arose from the Gordon Howell reports in 1959 and 1960, which changed the notion of management education from honorable stewardship of management in an organization to what is in fact logical positivism, positivism which is in fact turning management into a subject, management science where you're trying to mimic the physicists and the mathematicians and uh, create a, a scientific aura about management as a subject. You could equally well argue that the gap that we've been not attacking is the gap of, you know, I heard the word earlier on from one of you about dissemination. Disseminating the material that you have and making it readable and sensible to a management audience. I mean, I, I have been a dean a number of times but I well remember one conversation when I was dean at Warwick Business School where the chairman of the advisory board said to me, will you come back ne next time and give us the 20 best papers of your academics so that the advisory board can read them? So I went round and I did a sort of Delphi amongst my colleagues of the 20 best papers and I emailed them out to the people on the advisory board. They, we then had a meeting probably three months later and the, the uh, resounding comment from the chair when he uh, made his initial speech was, you know, it was really nice to have these papers, uh, but you need to have a PhD to uh, understand the title, let alone the contents. So I think it is a case in part of physician heal thyself in the sense of, uh, you know, translating this information in a meaningful way. And management, therefore, is in part a local construct as well as a um, general concept, construct or a universal con construct. So for the moment, those are the key points in that first edX article. I'm summarizing it quickly because yeah. you haven't yourself had a chance to read it. But those were the, the um, theoretical constructs we thought about before we had actually interviewed the 120 or so people we've interviewed around Africa over the last two and a half years. And what we come back with is to say, well, we ask them about those same issues. And what you find when you look at that, that uh, diagram there is a need to contextualize management education was number one. Number two was management education needs adaptation. Number three was management is an universal construct. So presumably, some of the principles of management apply across um, uh, different countries and uh, across different contexts, and others don't. And then we go down from the range of 20-odd percentage points to the remaining um, uh, observations, the, which in effect say that the Western model is too dominant, that it requires leadership to establish an African model and less belief that management is a local con construct and a relatively um, um, uh, um, small number of people who believed that the African model needs definite um, adapt adaptation. The interesting thing though is, is that contextualizing and adaptation are the two most important issues. The African model itself was something that people 
found, uh, found it hard to grasp with, with 54 different countries and uh, a whole d range of different cultural and, uh, and other kinds of issues. So with that, w which is, if you like, some findings from asking those kinds of issues in a practical context, um, I'm going to switch to Morris yes. and ask him to take up the discussion that follows from those points. Thank you very much, um, Howard. So I'm going to integrate some of the questions that we've pre-prepared together with the questions that are coming online and possibly a cold call using an old method of business schools, a cold call uh, an African brother from another mother, uh, Jonathan Cook, <laughs> and, and ask you, uh, firstly, we're going to go online um, and say, in your experience, given the various African countries, we know that Africa is not a continent, it's not a country, it's a continent, given the various African countries in which you travel and engage on business education, um, uh, and, and I will bring this back to you, Howard, a little later, but I want to start with the plenary, is what do African schools need to do differently to meet their context needs, given the uncertainty and dynamism in the African continent. Okay, thanks, Morris. There is indeed geographical variety, but I think there's even greater variety within geographies. And I was just looking at that first question up on the screen there, what are the biggest ongoing challenges facing business? Well, immediately begs the question, which business? <laughs> and what has really struck me since uh, co-founding the African Management Initiative and moving partly out of the business school world is how many businesses there are out there and how few of them actually have the privilege of access to a business school. So um, the, the, the regions certainly are different. There are, there are linguistic differences. There are business model differences. There are cultural differences, of course, um, and all sorts of differences and, and scale differences, which are quite significant as well. And what st has struck me is, I think, the need for greater variety in our solutions. So I would, I would appeal both for greater innovation, which is, uh, I think, where we are working at the moment, finding great excitement, but also greater uh, attention to the basics, um, particularly given the poor educational uh, uh, products that, that many African countries are, are guilty of at the moment. Uh, whatever business you're running, you still need to be able to read a monthly income uh, statement and a balance sheet if you're more than a two or three person business. Uh, even if you are only a two or three person business, you need to understand how to, how to access a market and understand your market. You need elements of process, quality and control. Uh, you need to be able to relate to people. And there's an interesting study just come out uh, f uh, uh, from Togo where the soft skills training, or the sort of psychological they called it, these were economists <laughs> doing the, the research, the psychological input produced greater impact on small businesses than did the business training. So there's this huge variety of different skills needed to run businesses uh, across the differing, differing countries and contexts of, of Africa. And so in responding to that, I agree, Howard, that we need to understand our our niche in a sense, and do that really well. And I think business schools do a fantastic job of preparing large organizations uh, for global impact. There's nothing wrong with doing that. We need global African companies. Um, we need probably also to think of other contexts and decide whether we have enough capacity in-house to address smaller businesses, to address local businesses. Uh, as I know, schools like this one, Gibbs, has, has been uh, doing interesting work on. Uh, and then we need to, as I've been doing with African Management Initiative, create new ways of blended learning and, and, and addressing different kinds of organization. Thank you so much. Maybe while you edit, I will, my new sister from another mother, Joan, uh, behind you there. Is that right? Unless I'm not reading correct. Is it Joan? Yes, it's I'm half blind, Joan, so I can't quite <laughs> see it that kind of a yeah, distance. <laughs> so I, 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 I was wondering if, so thank you, Jonathan, for taking on that question in terms of the geographic diversity and maybe linking it to the question on the screen, which is what are the biggest ongoing challenges facing business? And Jonathan effectively said, which business? Because 
that question is quite naughty in of itself because it, it, it reveals something of the person who's asking less about the question itself. Is, do you think, to the extent that there are such different challenges in Africa, assuming you agree with that, on the African continent, uh, uh, do you think that African businesses have their, their, their problems are unique to Africa, or are African businesses experiencing similar problems that other businesses, let's say in Latin America or India and other places are experiencing? In other words, are business schools on this continent solving very different problems to business schools in other parts of the world? Okay. I think um, to an extent that um, African businesses will be experiencing the same sort of challenges um, all over the world. But I think that for schools in particular to be able to address those challenges, they have to actually find out what sort of challenges are within their immediate communities. Um, mm -hmm. There probably can't be an African-wide kind of business um, school. I think that the business school really has to focus on addressing the challenges of its immediate community by finding out what those challenges are. And they have to be relevant to the communities which they serve. I think that that's um, the way that um, we can go on to find um, to solve the challenges facing the, con the, the continent in small portions. I think that's the way to go. Wonderful. So if I may maybe move to the other side, Ellison, whilst you're taking notes, ask you to re reflect on the question, what lessons have, have been learned or missed in the past in the evolution of management education across and within Africa? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so ju just so whilst you're reflecting on that, if you could scroll down, uh, I just want to respond to Stephen Davidson. I don't know if you know Stephen. Do you know Stephen? Yeah. Uh, is he one of your uh, co-conspirators? He's an associate dean at, uh, at BU. That's right. So um, uh, the point about that Stephen makes there is that business education is dated gaps have appeared, um, Africa has an opportunity to lead in driving new models the world can learn from. You know, so I'm a, a, a small student of uh, military history, and um, when you read about military history, uh, and military strategy in particular, uh, you, you, you realize that um, strategy from a military perspective was responding to issues on the ground so they didn't strategize and stick to Porter's five forces ad infinitum. <laughs> they said, what problems are we dealing with today? Right? So whether it's the military of Shaka Zulu in, 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 in the southern tip of Africa or the military of Napoleon Bonaparte in Europe, they were solving the contemporary problems of the day. Right? And so the question is, in a business school perspective, particularly in an African context, given the dominance of uh, the Western world view of business. Are we using frameworks that were developed for a context that is unique to the West, or is it a context that is universal? So in other words, have we learned anything? Um, are we missing anything in terms of how management education has evolved? So I'm just trying to locate it in the context of uh, are we universal in the, in the problems that we're solving for, or are there, something, are there things that are unique to African countries that we need to be learning from in terms of how we move business education? Thank you, Morris. Um, so I'm no expert on, on management lessons from Africa, but I think what struck me as you were asking that question is something that's a little bit more germane to human beings in general, I think. Um, and that is that we tend to try and solve new problems from the lens of the old problem. Um, and I think there's been some very much more sophisticated quotes around using the, you know, trying to use old lenses to, to look at a new issue. And the two things that I'm sitting with in terms of that are, um, have business schools become places that are rigorous academically and potentially even focused on practitioner industry related vocations, I think somebody said, um, whilst the indication is, is being signaled to us that, that something else is changing. So we're still debating in some ways, are we 
practically relevant or academically rigorous, and something else is happening in the meantime. Um, and just given the space that I work in, something that, that we're very mindful of is hyper-personalization. So individuals really wanting recognition in terms of how they make meaning of their own lives and how they apply the learnings that they get at a business school into their own context and have some uh, means of, of control over how that gets executed. Um, and we're still talking about sort of more macro concepts of academic institutions versus practical relevance. So that's one thing that, I, that I'm struck with. The other one is, is around your earlier question around digitization. Yep. Um, and, you know, I look at that and I think digitization brings with it a very hyper-networked society. And that gives us a lot of opportunities to solve problems in ways we haven't solved them before. And the kind of thing I'm thinking about is how about industries getting together that have never collaborated before to solve problems in a completely new lens. Mm. But we're not leveraging the opportunity that that kind of hyper-connection makes for us. And often we lose that benefit. And whilst we're still struggling, to even understand what it is to be hyper-connected. So we're explode, exploding the, the kind of um, uh, digital opportunities and the education opportunities that go with that without necessarily focusing on the human being that needs to make sense of how to be connected. And I think we're missing an opportunity to solve problems in a different way. So I know that hasn't directly answered your question, but just some thoughts on Wonderful. On no, you problems. have. So as we, as we move over to Alison on this side, so you've, you've, you've We've given you a few more words to think about hyper-personalization, hyper-networked uh, societies, which helped us to think about opportunities for solving problems in a different way. Yes? Mm. Mm. Hyper, hyper, hyper. You're going to need to wake up there. <laughs> um, just, just leaving you off what, what Alison said, and it's a little antidote. I don't know if you, there's, there's a TV program on at the moment where they use the internet for decision making. And, and the whole concept is, is that if, if all of you in the room were asked to guess my, my weight, you know, you might be roundabout right, but if you consolidated the, the full room, you would, you would get the, erect, the correct answer. So, you know, there is... The wisdom of crowds. That's right, that's right. Anyway, that's a little <laughs> antidote on, on, on that one there. And I think that is going to change things. It's, it's not, you, you know, Jonathan talked about us all understanding, you know, the income statement and the balance sheet. But that's in, in the, our previous traditional ways of thinking. It's the FD and the finance manager, you know, the CFO that needs to interpret it. And maybe the, the group-wide thinking of, of doing things will, will create something different. Um, going to your, to your question around African challenges, is it's my personal opinion that I, I think I, I really like your, th your three C's and specifically the culture element in, in Africa. I don't think we've come to grips at all in terms of how do, how do the, the cultures in, in, the, in Africa make decisions? I mean, you, you see it in, in the family environments when there's something happens, you know, everybody gets around and you have the whole household and, the, and making a decision or the whole environment. And we, we haven't come to grips on that's the way of doing things. What does that mean in the business context? Um, on, on the Fortune 500 companies, it might still be all of the same. But working with what you said, Morris, you know, what's happening on the ground and what Shaka is happening in the ground, 90% of, of the businesses in Africa are not the Fortune 500s where you sit, they sit in these big things. They, they are middle and low, you know, lower tiered businesses that need to survive and the way in which they do decision making, et, et cetera, is, is completely different. And I don't think we've come to grips with the cultural elements and how that impacts businesses in Africa. Well, thank you. So I'm going to hand over to you, but maybe it's just a provocation. One of my colleagues has been doing uh, research in 16 countries uh, on the African continent. I think she's completed 10 of those already. She's got six more to go. Um, and one of the insights that is coming out of um, uh, interviews with senior leaders in organizations and different types of organizations is this notion of spirituality uh, in business. So I'm linking to your notion of group decision-making as the norm in, 
in an African context, something we can own, um, and, and then linking that to also this new notion for us, I suppose we naturally know of it as spirituality, uh, thinking about our ancestors, but I, I'd never actually imagined it had found its way into the business community and how business decision making is influenced by spirituality. And I'm not talking about religion as a, as a good Welsh son of the Welsh soil. As you know, religion is very strong where you grew up. I'm talking about spirituality here. So I wonder as we think forward about what is the role of spirituality in business education and how that could help us understand uh, how African people make different decisions in a different way. Um, and you may want to reflect on that and some of the discussion as a segue into the next part on um, reflecting on the, the competitive environment in the African context. I mean, I think, I think there are some similarities between Asian and African um, um, communitarianism ideals. I mean, the family is terribly important. Um, uh, people make decisions on the basis. I mean, I, I remember reading uh, um, you know, one of the interviews where the person said, well, they hadn't been willing to call out a, a senior member of an organization. This was an African organization because they wanted to ensure that they kept their job. And if they kept their job, then their fa family would have enough money to survive for the next year. So I think the question of com communitarianism is true in Asia as well as in Africa. Family is important. The bar, you know, you, you have in, in, in Africa the, the notion of Ubuntu. Uh, and, and, you know, communitarianism, I mean, is evident in both of those two cultures. I think it's less evident in other cultures, but it varies. I mean, in Italy, the family is a very strong entity. Yeah, I mean, you know, you look at what's happened in the United States and people have moved from one part of the United States to another and the, the ties that bind families together uh, don't hold in quite the same way. But, you know, family is an important issue. And the notion of group uh, um, um, working, you know, a lot of the, there's a lot of research in Britain about Asian entrepreneurs and how they've been incredibly successful. And it's really the family that's at the background of, of, of the driving force and the resilience that keeps them going, um, often starting as small shopkeepers and building up huge businesses and doing it very, very well. I mean, one friend of mine in, in the UK start, came out from Uganda when, when Idi Amin was president and uh, was an accountant in, in Ghana. He's one of the major hotel entrepreneurs in Britain at the moment. Um, and has done ex extremely well. So I think you do have to look at, you know, spiritualism, and you also have to have a look at family structures, and, and those are terribly important. I mean, for me to summarize all of the elements that have been coming up the, in, in, on the, um, on the Twitter feed here is pretty difficult. However, uh, uh, what I do want to hold you accountable for is an earlier question that I had posed to uh, the, the plenary that I think came from Imad, uh, which was um, in your experience. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember the question. In your experience, what are some of the insights that you think or contributions you could make to business schools on the African continent that could help them to think about how to shift the needle in terms of moving forward to become more relevant? So this whole notion of relevance. So I, I know we are making a contribution as we go along, but how can we become more relevant as business schools on the African continent? Well, Jonathan made one point. I mean, it's perfectly valid for there to be schools in Africa which are globally impactful and produce managers that can work for multinationals, and there is a market for that. But I'd say the large market in Africa and the large market in many parts of Asia is the market to uh, bring the business schools close to the region or close to the environment in which they operate. Um, and, you know, I could give you any number of examples, Well, I'll give you a recent one. I mean, I have a grant in, in um, SMU that I got from MasterCard, which is a grant on uh, social and financial inclusion. And we've run a number of conferences recently, but I, I have one PhD student working in the Philippines. And he's been working in 
local communities. And local communities, the unit of analysis is very, very different. That's what I talk about when I'm talking about civil society. But the role of us as business school academics has been huge because the, um, these are fishing communities and rural communities, yet we're trying to bring them into the inclusive um, uh, business domain, trying through uh, our work to make them more impactful. And so I don't think it's just that a business school should be globally impactful, it should be regionally or locally impactful. And, and the connections between business schools. I actually don't like the word business school. I like the word school for management um, because I, or management schools because I think the audiences, as I've said before, are those audiences of you know, business, government, and civil society. And the degree to which you need business schools to do all of those things uh, is, is a real issue. I mean, I know I'm going to talk about this a little bit later on, but let me bring this topic in right now. I mean, accreditation was mentioned in, in, in one of my uh, uh, pr uh, slides earlier on. The, the issue with accreditation is that, you know, these are international standards, if you like, that are devised by AACSB um, and so on, EFMD and so on. But tomorrow, um, you know, Ron Siebert is giving a, a, a pre-conference event on accreditation. But AABS has already decided that it will set up its own accreditation processes for regional and local schools in Africa that need uh, an upskilling in standards. And so to answer, uh, this is a long-winded way of answering uh, Imad's question, but I'm trying not to be long-winded. Um, I wouldn't no. answer that one, Jess, said I will come back to his next question. But I just do want to make a comment uh, yeah, okay. uh, in defense of business in, in, in business school. Um, is that you know, if you got rid of business, we would have to change our name from Gibbs to Gims. And, and, and uh, I'm not quite sure that we're quite ready yet to change uh, okay. to Gims. So I wonder if we could... Uh, well, don't forget <laughs> what we were called Singapore Management <laughs> University, not Singapore <laughs> Business School. So we put our money where our mouth was. <laughs> so I wonder if we could move on to the next section, and then I'll come back to the next few questions that are streaming in, as well as the ones that I've got... Um, um, Okay, well, the, the, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm going to take Imad's question up about in, um, uh, on the Twitter feed about entrepreneurship and sustainable development subsequently. So and and, and, uh, and make a note of uh, and like global note. compact yeah, and, and sustainable development goals. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> the second uh, um, piece of reading that is in the edX course is a, a reading of insights from African leaders. And I've picked out there the five main themes they talk about in um, uh, Afri African leaders looking at the context of management education. One is the competitive environment. And the competitive environment is such that there are more players coming into this marketplace. And in fact, there are more private players coming into this marketplace. I know for a fact that one or two business schools around this region have been approached by private equity companies in order to, to acquire the assets of those companies. And so you're seeing a, a thriving competitive environment. The question about a competitive environment, uh, always, if you're talking about uh, competitive advantage uh, and competitive positioning, is exactly what competitive advantage and competitive positioning are you trying to attack? Um, are you trying to get the global market and, you know, out, g g out, uh, outperform Gibbs or Gims or whatever you want to call it? <laughs> uh, or are you going to come in and try and provide uh, a high quality uh, um, service, let's say, in um, blended learning or online learning, um, which in itself is not uh, cheap, but on the other hand, might attack those whole questions that are tremendously important in Africa of getting more people trained in management uh, and getting them trained in an effective, updated, quick manner. Not necessarily through the, the form of degrees. It could th be through 
bite-sized modules. It could be through a variant of the kinds of things that we've already seen in MOOCs. I mean, after all, you can take the boot camp of Wharton's MBA program, the five boot camp courses, for free. As long as you don't want a certificate, you can go in there and make a deal and get those courses taught with auxiliary materials in, in, in an African context. So you see an awful lot of people coming into this marketplace, not just the government players, but players who are coming in, perhaps to disaggregate the value chain, maybe to, to provide a form of online or blended uh, learning, or perhaps coming in to specialize solely in executive education, and so on and so forth, trying to pick off uh, some of the more profitable parts or the more interesting parts. Growth is evident simply because you have a huge demographic dividend in Africa. Um, you have a tremendous, tremendously young population that is thirsting for jobs, thirsting for opportunities, and the same is true in India, by the way. So you, you know, there are very strong parallels. I mean, the difference in India is that India a long time ago created the IIMs and the IITs, uh, which are uh, world-class institutions that are, um, you know, the, the underlying, I mean, 10 uh, institu Indian Institutes of Management, 10 Indian Institutes of Technology, but 4,000 private schools, or more. And many of them fall out in a given year. So this is, what you're going to see is not only a growth environment and a competitive environment, but success and failure as people come in to try and pick off, the, pick off niches in the marketplace. I pick out quality improvement because, you know, African, African management education, like every other form of management education, needs role models. So the fact that Gibbs is the only school in Africa that happens to be in the, what is it, the FT EMBA rankings and the FT executive MBA rankings is, is a strength of Gibbs and a strength in its own positioning. It's a strength that would be a strength uh, in comparison to schools like Strathmore and Kenya of um, Lagos Business School in, in, in uh, Nigeria, of um, Gimpa in, in Ghana and so on and so forth. So, you know, in some ways that people in that niche are attacking accreditations like um, AACSB and so on and so forth, EFMD. Yet, I think the attempt of African institutions themselves to set up an accreditation system through AABS, AABS is an important one. And I think AABS, frankly, I think has done a really great job of binding together business schools in the African continent. And long may it continue because I think it's been doing a terrific job for a long time, and the degree to which we can uh, make that work even more strongly is is uh, is very important. African identity we've talked about already, and that is in itself uh, a really interesting point. And you know, uh, Jonathan, I think probably summarised it better than I possibly could because. Uh, so you ask the question, well, why is this? And the question comes back to context, culture, and systems that exist in those countries. So when we talk about technology, we have to understand that technology isn't um, a panacea. It has to be looked at in a, uh, a contextualized form, as well as looking at it in the way that uh, M-Pesa did a tremendous job in terms of uh, the mobile payment system in, in um, uh, Kenya, but which has been mimicked in parts of Asia very, very successfully. Um, and very successfully, contextually, in, ver in uh, a number of countries. And uh, I could quote those countries if it were necessary, but I think I've introduced the elements in that, in that additional reading. So what I, I'm charged to do at this point is to make sure that I put up a, uh, um, what the people we interviewed said as you know, the most important uh, topics in that range, and you can actually see them ordered together down the chart on the left-hand side. Growth's the most important, quality improvement, African identity, technology. Interestingly, collaboration. I mean, I, I have been a business school dean four times, 
And people always in business school conferences talk about, well, we must collaborate with each other. And it never happens. <laughs> they don't collaborate, they compete. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like, um, you know, I feel like I ought to be doing it, but actually I don't want to do it. Um, so collaboration is an interesting one. Government is, is also an interesting one. And I think government is an interesting element right across Africa. I mean, the degree to which governments uh, influence uh, the conduct of education is very, very strong. And the degree to which partnerships can be engendered with government is important. Um, and the university structure is probably the least important of all of those. Um, I'm not sure I totally agree with that, uh, particularly when you go and uh, look at large state universities in, in, in countries like Kenya, for example, and trying to compete. The University of Nairobi is trying to compete with Strathmore, for example. Um, so that gives you the ammunition. Yes, thank you. Um, I, so I, I'll, I'll slam up the questions. Yes. So, so I think whilst you're slamming up those questions, I'm going to ask you to look at those questions and All study right. those uh, questions. I thought you might. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to get us back into a buzz group just to create a yeah. little bit more energy okay. in the room. And the, the buzz question that I'd like you to reflect on is uh, maybe the last question on the is does the entrance of international business schools from North America and Europe in certain African school, African countries, I should read, help or harm management education, in, or help or harm management education in Africa? I'll just give you a minute. Just do a quick buzz group. We're losing, so, the, we're losing the audience. So I'm not sure how you want to respond to some of those comments. Um, well, he's wrong. Well, the email one is, and... Um, yeah. OK, I wonder if I can bring you back. And Tracy, you're up. You're it. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so can we get a, a mic to Tracy, please? I'm very pleased that I um, had people like this in the group because I'm very new to this world and I'm overwhelmed by it all. I've only dealt with management on a very basic level because I've worked with NPOs in informal settlements and grassroots levels and that's very different to what I've seen and perceived here. So <laughs> my, my erstwhile colleague here tells me that... What's your erstwhile colleague's name? Joan. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, says that, that it's very dependent on, on the intention of, of an organization that comes in as to whether it could be successful or not so ex successful. Do you want to pick up on that again, Joan? Yeah, just okay, so um, what I said was that um, it depends on the intention of the business school or the management education institution coming into Africa. Now, if they wanted to come in, I mean, when they come into Africa, they usually will want to collaborate with schools that already are in the continent. And if they come in with the intention of up, um, upgrading the standard of education, bringing in foreign perspectives, global perspectives, expertise, then that would be helpful to management education in Africa. But if they came in with the intention of trying to grab the market, then of course it would harm the 
management education in Africa because um, they may want to um, take, out, take out students and not necessarily bring those ideas back into helping to improve um, education and management practice within Africa because the ideas might also be foreign. Wonderful, thank you. Maybe I can come to you, Angelique, uh, to maybe to share some of the conversation that you were having on, on that side of the room um, around this question about is internationalization of the multinational business school coming into uh, African countries uh, a force for good or f a force for concern? So uh, we were discussing and we thought it could be both. So a uh, force for good could be if there is two-way learning. So if these schools are coming in and not just teaching from their perspective, but also learning from the country perspective and taking that back, it could be a force for the good. We also then said it could be harmful um, if things like meaning, concepts, assumptions aren't clarified. So um, Shanjeev gave an example of digitization and e-commerce. So the systems um, and the technologies that's used in America is different to the systems and technologies that's available and used in Asia or India, for example. So if people come in trying to explain and enforce something, um, systems that they use, not clarifying the understanding of this in this country of what they use, in, uh, is it um, a laptop, is it a smartphone, is it um, uh, a I t um, iPad or whatever the case may be. So if they don't do that, there's going to be that could be potentially harmful because the learning is not going to be as meaningful as it was intended. Excellent, thank you. You know, I don't know if you know uh, Howard, but we are reputed as South Africa to have the highest um, Gini coefficient in the world, um, mm. if not the highest this year, certainly in the top three at any given point in time. Mm. Um, in extra of 60%. Um, and however, if you disaggregate a, a significant one group out of that, that is the unemployed, because we have about high unemployment at sitting at around 27% unemployment, and it's stubbornly at those levels, our Gini coefficient collapses. We're quite an equal country. We are in the low single digits in terms of the mm. inequality between the working people that at the bottom of the pyramid mm. as well as the wealthy people at the top of the pyramid. So clearly unemployment is a big issue in our country mm. and it would be a big issue in the rest of the continent. Mm. So linking on to Imad and mm. really reflect on, on the role of business schools in tackling uh, uh, youth unemployment in particular, and, and scarce resources on the African continent. What role do you think business schools could play, um, both local business schools and international business schools coming into the African continent in addressing that problem? Yeah, I mean, Imad's question is, uh, basically says that customized knowledge about uh, entrepreneurship and sustainable development is needed given the youth unemployment and the scarcity of resources in Africa. Um, I, whilst I agree with the sentiment, I think uh, there has to be um, an initiative beyond that. And, and you know, for example, I know I'm, I'm, I'm giving an example outside of the context of Africa, but I'm going to do it for the purposes of um, clarity. When you talk about sustainability, um, there are many of us in this room who remember reading uh, the material on limits to growth. You know, the studies that came out from MIT in the late 1980s, and, you know, we'd all be running out of resources by 2020. 1976. 1976. Well, he's, he's got the <laughs> date right for me. But we're all going to be running out of resources. Well, the answer is we aren't running out of resources, but we aren't running out of resources because certain cu countries have played the game pretty well. And I'll give you as an example, Japan. Um, I was in Tokyo probably a, a month ago meeting with some people from Mitsubishi Economic Research Institute, and it doesn't matter what we were talking about, but it had to do with sustainability. And they were going over all of the things that Japan has virtually no resources. Japan was not energy efficient. 
Japan did not insulate its houses, and so on and so forth. He created a whole set of industries out of each of those uh, requirements to get, gain energy efficiency, to make smaller, more energy efficient <coughs> fridges, God knows what else. The drive has to come not just from the educational institutions to produce programs in entrepreneurship and sustainable development. The drive has to come from government too. And I'm not suggesting that it's government putting money into it, but government giving incentives for younger people to get involved in entrepreneurial activity and for the, the educational institutions themselves to partner with those uh, uh, environments. I mean, I myself have been doing work over the last two or three years in social entrepreneurship. And it's quite remarkable which, what can be done. You have people here I know who do work in that area. But, you know, I, I can give you an example, for example, in Myanmar of a Canadian lady who has, has uh, built a bakehouse called Yangon Bakehouse, which is in effect uh, a coffee shop with a bakehouse where she trains uh, very poor women who have had no education. They become employable as bakers and uh, as coffee shop workers, and she gets them employment, teaches them financial literacy, teaches them financial inclusion. I mean, it's all very well to say that the business school should be creating these these courses, but we should be ourselves trying to build up these kinds of partnerships. It doesn't happen by just having a course in entrepreneurship. It happens by having the project or projects that make it work. And that's why I would argue that the answer to this question is, I totally agree with what Imad is saying, but it's the means by which we do it that's important. It isn't transferring courses in entrepreneurship or sustainable development from other countries. It is trying to make it more practical in the context of where we are that will make that improvement much more significant. And that's what I would like to see happening. Um, you cannot solve that problem. I mean, and your statement about the Gini coefficient is true. I mean, that you could make a similar statement if you took India and took out the percentage that, that are unemployed in India. I mean, India, uh, as you all know, is a place where, you know, my latest book, which is now in press, is being types, typeset in India. My last two were typeset in India. They're done, you know, at a fraction of the cost of what they were done in, in the West. They're, these people have set themselves up in very nice little businesses. IT is a similar phenomenon in India. Um, the second largest uh, um, consultancy company in IT is Tata Consultancy Services. Number one is Accenture. So, you know, what I would say is, I totally agree with what he's saying, but there needs to be a partnership between business schools, business, government, and civil society to enact projects that make it work. Otherwise, you're not gonna, you're not gonna uh, hit, the, hit the sweet spot and reduce that unemployment. We have to show exemplars of how we do it, rather than simply saying we must... Uh, I agree about customized knowledge, but that in itself is not going to solve the problem. So effectively, we're pointing IMA to uh, SDG goal number 17, which is partnerships. Yeah. Um, so allow me to ask you, uh, the, 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 the delegates, to reflect on uh, this notion of education and learning. I think the conversation has been about... Mm -hmm we are moving between learning on the one hand and education on the other. And I want to locate this question about whether students benefit from a school offering a global brand and network or one offering local contextualization. Because it really speaks to this whole question about is it about learning or about education? Um, and I want to just throw that out there to whoever wants to pick up that ball uh, Haley, do you want to pick up that ball? Good afternoon. Good um, afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, so I've just, while, while uh, uh, Professor um, Thomas was talking, I was reflecting on those two questions, and I think that what he was saying leads quite nicely into them. Um, so I think they're two very different things um, in terms of um, a local school um, having a global brand um, 
and being internationally recognized um, and really fundamentally understanding the local context, which I think is really important. Um, and then the consideration of the entrance of international business schools from North America and Europe into African countries. Um, and what was playing in my mind was um, what do North American business schools and European business schools really know about doing business in Africa? Um, and I think that um, I don't necessarily think it can harm management education uh, because obviously there's a lot that we, um, uh, being, being an African, you know, being um, uh, the content, uh, co continent of Africa can lear learn from very well established business schools. But um, it goes back to that local contextualization and what do they really know and understand about doing business in Africa because I think it's obviously fundamentally different to anywhere else in the world. Um, and so, and so, and so I, I suppose the point that I'm trying to make is that what we really need is um, um, business schools that are um, global and internationally recognized because of the good that they do and that they are, are um, 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 able to, to uh, project um, world-class standards, but that fundamentally and really understand uh, the local context and um, what is happening in the country um, on the ground in terms of business. Well, Haley, thank you for that. It really then links us nicely for me into the next set of <coughs> questions. Um, and, and on this one, I just want to highlight the note, notion of it's a, it's a forward-looking perspective. What is the best case scenario for management education in and for Africa in the next, uh, in the upcoming decades? So what is the best case scenario for us? Um, Wendy, perhaps I could ask you. Um, no, not y you're still thinking, thinking out loud. All right, Sanjeev, your thoughts. We're going to give you a mic. Hello. Uh, I believe the the future, from a future perspective, this collaborative approach is the quite uh, is a key. Go ahead. Yeah, so what I was saying is like, you know, from the future perspective, is a collaborative approach is the key uh, for any business school because there's a lot of things we, you know, globally we can learn from the various geographies and how the business has been done. But the moment the other, every, you know, most of our <laughs> colleagues are saying, and I agree, the, the moment we learn from there and put the context, the local context, so how, how we can have a proper mix of this through the collaboration. So that's, that's how the way forward uh, to go towards that. Okay, so, and, and very recently, I, I'll give one example, like, you know, uh, so in, in India, a very few weeks ago, the government has introduced how to boost the economy on the agriculture sector. Because today's Indian economy is still, those ITs were known, but still 70% comes from uh, yeah, agriculture sector. So from agriculture sector, how, how to empower the, you know, the financial inclusion there. So, so they, they have given various incentive. It's not a funding. Okay, they have created the various schemes and incentive schemes where the entrepreneurs can come there and they can collaborate and do the food processing industry, cold storage, and all those kind of various kind of things that can be done. But it's not that they are not, government doesn't have money to throw, but they are creating an environment so where the, uh, you know, the business schools are teaching in terms of how to do the proper management and entrepreneurship are, uh, you know, uh, is further developed there. So this is how the collaborative things, which is, I believe, how the business school can be the center stage of uh, becoming the collaborative uh, uh, a space where these things can happen. That's, that's very cool. So I, I, I'd like to share whilst we move the, the mic over to Uda. In order for a an, certain an academic school to operate in our context, whether it's a local or international uh, academic school, they have to be licensed to operate. And um, in a in a small area, the government is providing funding for chairs, and one of the criteria, um, academic chairs, that is one of the criteria for providing funding, is for elite schools 
to collaborate with uh, previously or currently underprivileged schools. Mm. And, and so they're using the carrot, an incentive to facilitate uh, that collaboration. I'm wondering, as I'm sitting here listening to you talking about collaboration, Sanjeev, whether there may well be also an opportunity to use a stick to also encourage to say, to the extent that you start internationalizing into certain countries on the continent to avoid completely obliterating those schools in terms of picking out some of their best revenue streams, you may well be required to also be seen to be giving back to the education system, not necessarily to the ones that you're competing with directly, but certainly to the less developed educational institutions. Mm. I wonder if that's something that might sit well with other institutions in other parts of the world, and I wonder whether it is something that does exist as a model in other parts of the world. It's just a question. And whilst you're thinking about it, because I will eventually hand back to you, Howard, let me move over to Udo. Thank you very much. Um, I sh actually want to contribute more to the Africa collaboration yes. um, bis you know, between business schools. And by sharing an experience that I had, um, I was privileged to be involved in a project that actually involved six consortium universities. And of those six universities, um, three of them were business schools. And one of the give, things give that- Give us the countries in which they were located. Um, so it was in South Africa, Kenya, and Nigeria. And you know, we had a session sometime last year, and one of the things that came up was possibilities of collaboration in research between the faculty members from those universities. One thing that came out was you know, the intention and the need was established, but the actualization and implementation of any process to see it through was really lacking. Um, there was no driver in it. In fact, some of the faculty members who, who decided to drive it um, kind of hit you know, brick walls in the process. So unfortunately, I couldn't coordinate it for them to get them to mm. get somewhere. Mm. So you know, thinking about it, I think a possible solution, just like um, Morris had mentioned, you know, possible um, drivers that could lead to collaborations. A possible one for business schools, let me limit it to business schools now, um, could possibly be exchange of, of you know, students within, within those business schools. That could lead scholars that are teaching them to really collaborate in the process. And I say that because so many of the students um, within the business schools actually want to push their businesses across the, their local context. And that creates an opportunity for them to meet other players from different countries. And I'm not talking about going beyond Africa now, within Africa. Um, so students from Gibbs, for instance, um, going over to Lagos Business School, and some other students from Lagos Business School coming over to, to Gibbs. And in that process, creating a network of, of business students that could you know, continue to cement possible collaborations in the future. That could be a possible way of getting that collaboration. That's lovely. So that also links very nicely, Udo, with a final question in this, sec in this section, um, which is how can management educators across Africa collaborate to build curricula, one of those Latin words, um, and context relevant materials that are distinctive and adaptive to their goals and needs. I presume that is the goals and needs of the management educators. Um, so it really, so you, 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 uh, you attack that from the perspective of the learner, the student. Now this question then is then asking us to reflect from the perspective of educators. Um, and uh, maybe I could ask you to reflect on that as well, Howard. Yes. Well, I mean, this question is actually a, r a really rather important question because, I mean, let, let me give you a... Um, a parallel again in SMU. I mean, three or four years ago, we decided that the case studies that we were using were far too North American and far too Western. And so we started an Asian case study center. 
Uh, we've actually produced 125 or 130 cases, relatively short ones. They're not, none of them longer than seven or eight pages. Um, I've written a few of them. Um, and not any of mine, but several of them have won case awards from EFMD. Um, it would be really nice to see the same thing happening across a number of different schools in Africa. AABS has been helping to do this. Um, I think it should be reinforced. I think there are, somebody made the point earlier on, well, you know, you can learn from Africa um, about doing business in Africa. I mean, after all, the Africans know about doing business in Africa. And if we can't learn that, we're in deep trouble. Um, and of course, there are two aspects of, of Africa that are tremendously important here. One of which is you've got 54 countries. And, you know, you talk about global trade, but look at the extent of interregional trade. And interregional trade isn't as strong as it should be. I mean, you look at all the visa requirements in this, uh, across African countries. You look at all the transport arrangements. When I, you know, I have traveled probably now to about 22 or 23 African countries, I can tell you that air travel isn't cheap, and there aren't that many air routes from uh, significant cities to significant other cities. So how are you going to uh, foster interregional trade in Africa unless you can get, uh, um, you know, m much more like a, a, you know, I hate to say it in the context of Britain and Brexit at the moment, but a customs-free, uh, trade-free zone, which would enable um, interregional trade to take place. And, you know, that would be a reverse learning from if you like, the EU, you know, I'm not going to tell you what, uh, how I voted. I did vote. <laughs> um, but, you know, maybe my answer will tell you how I did vote. Um, but I think in this particular context, local materials are very important. The one thing that I think distinguishes many of the problems in Africa from many other countries is economic development. I mean, if you go back and look at various different dis issues of the economist over the last 10 years. It swung, it's like um, the swings of a pendulum. Africa rising, Africa slowing down, Africa now picking up again, and so on and so forth. And, and you say to yourself, we should be teaching much more about economic development and development finance than simply talk, you know, these are the things that are important in order to get FDI. These are the things important in order to raise the finance to generate the small businesses. I mean, these are the kinds of things that are important. So there are elements in African management education which are going to be significantly different from other places, and so they should be. You cannot um, look at the macro, you know, if you took an environmental scan of how you do business in a mature Western economy and look at an environmental scan of how you do business in uh, 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 any African economy you want to look at, the macroeconomic conditions are different. The legislative conditions are different. I could go down the list and they're all different. One thing you can learn is, of course, to try and ease these down. I mean, you know, Teaching people about regulation and how regulation impacts society is tremendously important. So economic development, development finance, case studies that are relevant to Africa. I mean, you know, I have not come in to study Africa for any other reason than I'm interested in it. I wanted to do it, but I'm trying to tell the story from the viewpoint of the Africans, not a, from the viewpoint of the West. And I think you have a lot to offer here, but I think I mean, I again would laud AABS for trying to bring these things together, and I wanted it to relate it to a point that was raised earlier. Um, AABS has been working with, on and off with EFMD for a period of time to try and work out some way of partnering between European universities and African uh, business schools. Um, and, and I think that initiative will in, in time work. But in the interim, I think there are going to be a number of, you know, smaller partnerships. EDAF, the uh, European Deans across Frontiers, has worked in, in, certain, in certain business schools in Africa, and they're not the biggest business schools. So, you know, partnerships are okay, provided you're not coming in and telling the people here that you know better than they do what, how, 
how to handle their environment. That, I think, is totally wrong. But I do think that the creation of African materials, the creation of differences, I mean, you know, the communi com communitarianism point is extremely strong. And understanding that, I didn't understand it in Asia for six months when I first went there. Uh, I mean, you know, so there are lots of things that we need to do here to contextualize and, con uh, and make the African context meaningful. But of course, that's what then educators elsewhere learn from Africa. They don't tell Africa what to do, they learn from Africa. And there are interesting case studies of African companies growing, not just the ones that we all know about, the big ones, but there are interesting case studies around, and those should be encouraged more and more. Uh, and I don't know what else to say other than, you know, uh, do it. Yes, Nike. And I'd like to echo your sentiments, Howard. There are amazing stories that are waiting to be told. Yeah. And it's, 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 a, it's, 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 a, it's an honor that people like you and others from outside of a continent are interested in our stories and are willing to tell them. But the real opportunity, uh, I believe, for us as educators is that we uh, need to also begin to tell our stories um, a lot more than we have in the past. And as I take a tilt to Tammy online, who says schools from the Western countries should try to learn from African business schools as equals, effectively, as knowledge co-creators. Mm. Um, you know, I'm reminded of a comment that I once read somewhere where somebody said, um, uh, I like flat structures as long as I'm on top. Um, yes. <laughs> you, you love rankings <laughs> if you're number one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so the scenario here is that we, read, we need real authentic yeah. partnerships yeah. and not superficial partnerships. And, and of course, um, uh, oftentimes we think of um, African business as Ma micro businesses, disorganized, informal businesses, and yet Africa is a tale of two cities, so to speak. That certainly, that part of that narrative of African countries or African businesses being populated by micro businesses, informal, is true, but equally true is of dynamic, large, global champions. And 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 in reflecting on on what uh, Emad is saying is that the best case scenario is to have regional champions that understand local contexts, uh, that are globally recognized, and that collaborate between each other. Here, I believe he's not only referring to the uh, big organizations in terms of the corporation, but also organizations like ourselves uh, and the likes of Strathmore and Lagos Business School, who are, I presume, the regional champions that understand league, uh, local context that we need to uh, maybe re reflect uh, on what Udo is saying and start collaborating a lot more because we're not really competing. We're trying to solve a much bigger problem than ourselves on the continent. And I suppose with that in mind, I'd like to segue into the next final session um, sure. of, of the conversation. I'd also like to make a point about that Udo made about collaboration. Yes. I mean, the, you cannot engineer collaboration you know directly a joint project is one way of doing it Peop one or two people who get to know each other and then and then build up that relationship and then the project developed i don't think i don't think it's easy to do it you know com organizationally in in the fashion you were, were discussing and that's not to belittle your efforts you know anything but anything but but you know, initiatives and willingness of people to work together to get those things done is, is very, very important. So I'm going to segue to the last bit so that we could um, uh, get some closure um, on, on the day. And the last, um, the last question, which is to some extent the, the easiest or the most difficult question, is you know, I, we've talked about the landscape. We know what the landscape is. Um, the paper that I, um, is the third paper in the edX course, is a paper which 
takes us all the way through, if you like, but builds up at the end of the day to start asking a series of questions about whether there should be a, a, a distinctive business model. But linking into what Yudo was saying before and also what uh, Morris was saying, the leading countries in terms of uh, uh, business education in, in uh, Africa have really been uh, South Africa, um, Kenya, uh, Nigeria, um, Ghana, Ghana. Mm -hmm. uh, but in North Africa, and we've had one of, uh, you know, Tammy Gorfi, whom I know extremely well, and, and uh, you know, the people in Eska, in, in Morocco, uh, Leila Tricky in Tunisia, Kareem Seguir, who used to be in, in Cairo in Egypt and is now president of a, an university in, in, um, in the Middle East. The, those are examples of schools that really have um, tried in, in, in a sensible way to build up what Imad just said before, the notion of regional champions who are not the only schools in those regions. I mean, if you go to Senegal or you go to um, 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 uh, Morocco, there are other schools in those countries. There are other schools in uh, two or three of them that would regard themselves as regional champions. None of them have necessarily got AACSB and the EFMD accreditation yet. They certainly might, but they have done a job in the context of North Africa uh, in terms of developing those schools. And similarly, if you look at West Africa, uh, there are a number of number of countries there that uh, have worked extremely hard. And if you go, if you go to uh, East Africa, it's not just Kenya, but you could look at Tanzania, and you could even look at Rwanda, um, you know, as an example of a, a country which has uh, come through an awful lot, and nevertheless, in terms of management education, has done some very interesting things. So I think we should look back to that point that Imad made a moment ago, which was point about regional champions. Whether or not you get global accreditation immediately, I really don't uh, uh, um, necessarily mind. I'm not here to, to sell uh, global accreditation, um, despite the fact that I've chaired AACSB and I've been vice president for business schools of FMD. That's not my role. I mean, my role here is to try and so what, what I've tried to do on this, uh, in this last article is to really summarize the contextual issues um, and uh, the issues that exist within management education that are important as we look at management education going forward. And some of them we've, we've looked at before. But one of the ones that's completely obvious when you talk about context is that governments have a lot to say about funding local universities. I'm not talking about private universities, but if you were to go to um, 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 Nairobi, there's the University of Nairobi School, but there's also uh, the Jomo Kenyatta School, um, and there's USIU in you know, three, three or four different schools. Jomo Kenyatta School has hardly got any resources whatsoever. Yet the people there trying to do a terrific job with low levels of resources. The fact is the government has a dominant role to play in funding. The government has a dominant role also to play in regulation of those business schools and what those business schools can or cannot do. So governments have an important influence, not just on management education, but on K through 12 education, to use the American words, or from kindergarten all the way up to graduation uh, when we get uh, the students in university. Uh, the competency levels of students, well, we've talked about this, but you know, I will come back and say to you, Morris, again, the graduation rate from South African high schools is 38. 38.5%. Yeah. There are other countries in Africa that have a much higher graduation rate. So We've got an issue, not just of management education. I mean, when I was over here, first of all, I spent time in the University of Johannesburg, which is a remarkable institution in many ways. 
but you know, merger of four different uh, universities, kids who really want to learn, but many of them are doing a remedial first year. You know, let's be realistic. It isn't just management education. We have to be careful about ensuring that the whole of the educational system works for everybody. And then you have diversity. Well, you've heard me on willful blindness very early on, but diversity is terribly important. And diversity and equality of opportunity, access, affordability, you know, you can only go as far as you want to go. And I, I believe that, you know, education is a tremendous uh, solution to many, many problems. I mean, I don't come from a wealthy background. I come from a Welsh mining valley. And education is what got me to wherever I've got to now. I'm not entirely sure where I've got to, <laughs> but I, I'm in a better place than I would have been as a coal miner, is what I would say. Then inadequate infrastructure. I mean, when you go around Africa, you, you know that there's infrastructure investment that needs to be made. And, you know, the, and there's a government role in infrastructure investment as well. And I'm not talking about investment in infrastructure, in internet, you know, roads, highways, electricity generation, um, energy efficiency. All of those kinds of things are infrastructural factors that are contextual and are tremendously important. And there's a role for government in those too. Or if it's a public-private partnership, uh, you know, a wholly bad word, a public-private partnership, if you talk about uh, British politics, uh, because that was the era of Tony Blair, which is now essentially devalued in Britain. But the public-private partnerships are a way of generating infrastructure if properly managed. Then you have issues within management education. And I'm not trying to say this, a lack of overall quality in African business schools. But the quality in African business schools has improved significantly. And what it needs is drivers to make sure that it does improve. I'm not here trying to say that there aren't bad business schools in Europe or elsewhere. There are. That there are bad business schools in Asia. There are bad business schools everywhere. But the desire, and again I come back to AABS, their role in a 10-year period to do a number of things to improve quality across all African schools has, in my opinion, been nothing short of remarkable. And long may it continue. Long may people go to it, even though they may not have the resources to go to it. That may also be an engine for collaboration of the kind you were talking about before. Um, faculty issues. Well, that's a, that's a worldwide problem. I sat in the room in, in, in Birmingham and, you know, after we're, I'd given my speech, they had a, a, a breakout where they had a, a, a voice vote on what was the most pressing issue. One of the most pressing issues was hiring faculty. So everybody's got the same problem. But I think what you have in Africa is is a desire to teach extremely well above all else. Not to say that research isn't important, but getting the instruction done well above all else is very, very important. So you see in the answers to questions that we pose to uh, uh, the people we talk to, the resilient question that always comes out when you ask them about um, faculty issues we have got to have a balance between PhD trained faculty and faculty who we can retrain, who've been in business, who can give that practical context in an environment and you know, really become very important. Um, my own school in, in Singapore, SMU, has three categories of faculty. Tenure track faculty who are PhD trained faculty it's about 58% of the business school faculty at the last count. The other 42% are what we call education faculty, whose, whose um, uh, dominant domain is to be better, 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 and better teachers every year, above all else. And pedagogy is the most important thing. And the second one is practical academics who do practical applied research and don't 
do the PhD oriented research. And they have the same titles, assistant, associate, and full professor. We ask them to do different things. A solution to a faculty problem is not to say everybody's got to have a PhD from Harvard or Stanford or Chicago or London Business School or wherever it is or PhD schools in Africa. It is to say that there are other ways of upskilling our faculty to get a very effective faculty and it's an answer you get from the deans themselves. We have to be more practically oriented. We have to use the resources we have available in order to get to whatever the mountain is we've got to climb to be, you know, if you like, globally recognized in a generation. You know, if that's the goal, the goal is brilliant, but you're not going to get there in five minutes. And the final thing is, you know, the changing competitive landscape. You know, the influx of private competition is around everywhere. And you can see it in, in you know, the merger activity in business schools, wherever, wherever it takes place. Um, here, you're going to see, hopefully, uh, private, the private sector getting involved in meaningful ways that will create uh, better opportunities uh, for uh, um, students in Africa. And indeed, that's the kind of suggestions you get from uh, the respondents. The one other slide I have here. The events and management investigation. Sorry? That one, yeah. Is events and management education. You know, I'm learning from this boy, and it's two and, <laughs> two and a quarter hours down the truck. He's teaching me how to teach. So, <laughs> so the, the, this is good. So <laughs> the events in management education, some of these we've talked about already, so I'm not going to go over technology. Political change is terribly important. A stable political environment means a heck of a lot of difference. I mean, I'll give you an example outside of Africa. Why did Singapore go from becoming... Uh, 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 a really unremarkable city-state on its founding in 1964-65 to the global city-state it now is. And this is through stable political environment and the genius, the absolute genius of the founder, you know, the first prime minister uh, who died last year, um, Lee Kuan Yew. So you cannot... You cannot underestimate the value of stable political environment and stable uh, uh, institutions. Partnerships are terribly important. I regard the AABS as a partnership between African business schools and themselves. And a very, very good partnership. There should be more partnerships between African business schools and anybody who wants to be a partner with them as long as they don't tell them what to do. That there's joint learning. If there isn't, the partnership is worthless. But the kinds of partnerships that EDAF has brought forward and EFMD would like to bring forward with AABS are the sorts of partnerships we should encourage. And academics who want to spend their time here should be encouraged to spend their time here. You know, I'm not doing it for the sake of my health, I can tell you. I'm doing it because I'm interested in it. I mean, and I will continue to come back as long as somebody, you know, puts on a, a mini jam <laughs> or w w we have an ICFMD event or an AABS event, I'll be there. So partnerships are terribly important. But partnerships are also important to stimulate the kinds of things that you're trying to argue for initiatives developed through, you know, person-to-person -person partnerships. And I remember one, one interviewee, and I won't tell you his name, but he was a lecturer in UJ. And I interviewed him, and he was uh, from, originally from the Soweto campus. And he said to me, he said, well, who are you? You know, why do you want to interview me? And I said, well, I'm interested in your views about management education. And at the end of the day, he, he sort of got pretty interested in SMU. So he said, do you have um, PhD programs there in operations management? And I said, yes, we do. He said, do you give scholarships? And I said, yes, we do. And he said, can you arrange an interview for me when I come to Singapore next? Because I've 
arranged to give a paper in a conference and you know, at the end of that year, six months away. He was there and he went to see all three universities in Singapore to get a PhD studentship. Now, that's how these things develop. You know, it's not going to develop through, you know, some highfalutin initiative. It's going to develop through people wanting to do it and working with others to do it. That's how initiatives develop. And the final thing is, well, African growth is with you. you uh, everywhere I go, and I, I said this to the guy who was driving me up here today from, from the hotel after I'd quickly changed. I said, you know, everywhere I go, people have got happy faces. You know, they're on, uh, entrepreneurial. They want to get ahead. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it'll happen. It won't happen in my lifetime, I guarantee you, unless, you know, your prediction of prosthetic limbs and God knows what means that we're going to live until 120. <laughs> I see no chance for me necessarily to see it, but it will happen. And I think if the people believe it will happen, it will happen eventually. I don't know the instrumentalities, but political change occurs quite, quite interestingly, when, as, as, as students of political history will tell you. So I've opened it up to you, Morris, to teach me how to... <laughs> <laughs> because you've been doing it all afternoon. <laughs> uh, we just pain. have, just have one question at yeah. the end. Well, we've got a few. We just start off with this one. And perhaps I could tilt to Tammy, who says, challenges in Africa are so different uh, and diverse, and we should consider ourselves a school for business for society. And with that, and maybe I can paraphrase the question that you're looking at on the screen to say, uh, what would African management models look like? Um, so uh, uh, maybe one or two comments from the floor. What should African management models look like, given this context that Howard has given to us in the last session? Daniela. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I think uh, one of the things that struck me with the potential of building an African management model is not necessarily it being clearly defined, but allowing for that evolution depending on the multitude of perspectives that we hold in Africa, but acknowledging potentially the more underlying elements that we might need to address. So some of the areas that I was noting down here was the ability to build institutions. One of the areas that um, I know Africa as a, as kind of as a continent has, has struggled under is the fact that most of our institutions were built at a time when it was done for extraction, extraction of resources, extraction of, of, of many things. So the building of institutions and using what potentially is best practice, but what also then could we do in the African context to build those institutions, but specifically building them for the benefit of the people and not for, for exploitation and once again. And then I thought the idea of complexity, um, an African management model that looks at and can addresses, address the multitude perspectives, but also with the complexity of the evolution of our growth and our need for partnerships and our different um, requirements here in Africa. That also, as a management model, would, I think, potentially going forward, benefit um, some of our more developed partners uh, who are struggling potentially with a future that is looking more and more complicated and is something that we could have an expertise in uh, once we power through the benefit of having more than one a single story um, and, and creating that multiple stories out there. So I thought that, that those were some of the points that in the conversation I just thought I would raise and potentially answer that question. Okay, great. Alison, I wonder if I could, I'm going to move my way this way. I wonder if I could give you an opportunity few words around the previous question and possibly the whole notion of quality education, uh, quality in management ed education across Africa. What does that mean? And, and should accreditation play a role in that space? Um. Um, well, coming from a school that's also grappling with accreditation ourselves, I, I, I like the previous comments that Prof said earlier about that accreditation makes sure that there's a minimum standard. Um, and it, it gets you sort of the foundations there. But it, 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 
it loses the differentiation. It, it loses what is unique about um, Africa and what's unique about what we can offer to the, to the rest of the world. Um, so I'm, I'm certainly for it and, and I understand the benefits of it, but I don't think we need, must lose sight that that is the be all and end all. There is more to that to, to make us excellent and that'll get us into, into the 21st century. Um, in terms of the Africa context and, and that question that you posed to me, I, I honestly don't know. I don't, you know, I'd, I'm, I'm struggling and, th and that's the reason why I'm here, to get the insights and that. So I, I don't think we, we've certainly come to grips with it. Well, I haven't. Let me, let me smile and say that. Okay, great. Sanjeev, I'm going to move to you, then work my way that way. Yes, yeah, so, so in terms of uh, model, I believe, uh, you know, so how, how we can induct more practical aspect uh, of industry into the business model. So, so that's, that's one aspect I, I believe, uh, rather than just more focusing on academic stuff. So, so that, you know, uh, that's one aspect. And second aspect is how these institutions can become a center stage for a good governance model which can be propagated into the into the society itself because end of the day so that social factor if it's somehow a smaller portion been done so that 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 will uh, enhance the overall you know economy and business schools are getting benefited in terms in on the other side of it so that's that's what i believe there's two aspects if we can cover that's that's the model i believe it's good for oh, great thank you so as we move over to the other side, and uh, I'm going to come to you, Haley. Um, oftentimes, we think of ourselves, when we talk about business education, we think of business schools. But the ecosystem of business education is much wider than business schools. There's training institutions. There are um, independent <laughs> providers, as in individuals, let alone uh, companies, and they are consultants, they are in-house programs within companies, your so-called learning and development departments that are morphing into uh, corporate universities and so forth. So bearing that in mind in terms of that the, the space of business education is quite a complex space. It's not just the domain of business schools, how, how do you think business schools could play a role in uh, contributing to uh, uh, their knowledge and experience to really enhancing that ecosystem? The ecosystem of broader business education as opposed to the ecosystem of broader business schools. Mm. Um, so I think Maurice, I think you've raised it, and I think Daniela also raised it. Um, and I, I don't know if I'm going to be answering your question directly, so forgive me if I don't. But I think this notion of global complexity um, in considering a, 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 a management model, African management model, is, um, is something that's very interesting. And, and actually, it's, it's something that is, is, has been touched on across business schools, um, it's, it's almost like the hot topic at the moment. Um, so many business schools, many um, management schools, many um, private institutions that are offering um, management solutions or, or man management education solutions are all grappling with this uh, notion of global complexity. Um, and um, what I think is, is really perhaps perhaps interesting is that um, it, it's something that all of us need to be considering. So, so um, from, from an African management model um, perspective, I think it's important. Um, in terms of business schools contributing to that ecosystem, um, we really need to be the thought leaders in the space. So I understand that we've had that conversation about uh, practical applications and um, academic rigor, but really um, what drives uh, practical application, I mean, uh, you know, I, I love the theory, and um, that's what I, I I really believe in. So we need to be generating those those that that thought leadership um, in order to allow um, uh, or, or to contribute to that ecosystem. Um, and again, it comes back to um, yes, global complexity, and it's a an international word and an international 
buzzword at the moment, but um, what is the African context to understanding that, and how do we how do we ensure that others learn from us? So, so I think to, in terms of uh, models of, of management education, I think global complexity has to come into it, and certainly entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship um, uh, for, for, from from an, uh, a variety of uh, perspectives, uh, but from social impact, so social entrepreneurship, um, moving up the African continent, what can we do there, um, and and um, just n you know entrepreneurship from a from a pure profit point of view as well, um, because I think that gives back to 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 the continent and and countries. So I don't I don't think I answered no, your question. It, no, it, it is helpful. So maybe we can maybe ask Adrian to reflect, possibly from a technology point of view, is how, what role could technology play in these African management models that could emerge? Sorry, can I just add? Yes, Morris. you can add. Sorry, any um, time. and it's going it's going obviously back to the digital yes. um, question that we had right in the beginning, um, and it's been just sitting on my mind. So I think there are two things that are are, are, are different um, and and separate. Uh, one is um, that obviously. Um, digitization we need to be teaching and and um, learning and um, um, doing things differently because of of digital but how do we and perhaps sorry I've just said it but how do we teach differently and how do people learn differently because of technology and um, and digitization so so not only what is actually happening in, in terms of that space but how do we utilize that um, in order to teach and 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 ensure and facilitate learning in a different way um, because the way Millennials learn as we know is different to the way um, we learned and taught 20 years ago um, so so I think it's it's a very important um, thing to think about um, and and then also to consider is um, are African millennials different to North American millennials? Are they different to European millennials? And um, their ex accessibility to digital uh, components and digital aspects or di technology or physical technology um, does that um, change the way in in which we should be teaching and learning and facilitating learning um, from a business management perspective? So now, Adrian. Can okay, add go for it, Adrian. Said. Thank you. I don't know what to add to that. <laughs> you, you must have a little bit um, more to add to that, Adrian. Uh, so I think what she said, definitely. Um, and I also agree, I, I haven't always been in education, but I agree what, with what you said, uh, Professor Thomas, uh, right at the beginning, is that uh, technology isn't cheaper. So, so that's a challenge. Um, so certainly, if you're going to be running out and creating new forms of content, and distributing content differently and creating collaboration, uh, it's going to cost. It's going to cost in infrastructure, it's going to cost in time, it's going to cost in, in development, and, and potentially a continent like Africa, which isn't as wealthy as the rest of the continents, um, it might not be sort of the silver chalice. On the other hand, I think maybe Africa's got an opportunity to give back to the rest of the world when it comes to technology. Um, and maybe it's not answering the question, but, but if you look at the median ages of the continents as a whole, Africa is by far the youngest continent. I certainly remember trying to teach my mother how to use email. So I'm looking at America and I'm looking at uh, Europe and thinking, these people are probably not going to handle the next round of technology because, no offense to the older people in the room, including myself, they're not going to get it. But what you got is a continent full of people who are probably in that formative stage of education and they may be able to take management education to the next level and teach America and Europe a thing or two about using technology. Wonderful. So maybe if I could ask Jonathan to reflect on, we're sitting here in a classroom um, and we're having this conversation in the traditional form and place of learning in a business school and, and, and others are sitting on in their own homes, offices, in front of a computer, which then starts introducing other ways of learning. But in, in your mind, do we sacrifice quality in management education by having different forms of learning? This notion of blended learning, uh, this notion of, uh, and I think there's a technical term, autodidactic, you know, where you choose your own learning, um, as opposed to you being fed learning by, by, um, by, by an academic. Do you think there are different forms of learning that would be more relevant in our context, in our continent, 
without sacrificing quality education? Yes, and I think that is a critically important aspect for an accreditation system in Africa. Um, given, just to step back a bit and say that when it gets, when we look at the problems of faculty in African business schools, our f one of the unrecognized factors, I think, is our fee structure is a whole lot lower than uh, leading schools elsewhere. So we don't have the money to pay good salaries, which means there's a problem attracting good faculty. Plus, uh, we don't have resources to develop people over time and train mm. them. Plus, we don't have the resources to support their research, plus we don't have the resources to provide the infrastructure that leads to good research, et cetera. So we just cannot compete on a level pl uh, playing ground with the uh, existing problems attracting faculty in, in the North, in fact. So why do that? Why don't we acknowledge that the battle for content, in a sense, is already uh, fought? You can get the best professors teaching, uh, often for free, over the internet. So why bother to replicate that? Why don't we rather focus quality in another area, which is that our faculty, our facilitators, should be real experts at learning and at business and at the application of business. So let's import port quality except where we have to create African-specific uh, content, obviously. Let's export, import content and focus on the application, helping the students to apply it to their context. So. Um, at the moment, if you credit on teaching quality, you're seen as a second grade school or third or fourth, anyway, a lower grade school. And I think in Africa, when we look at quality, we need to turn that around and say, we will, we will credit on the quality of facilitating learning on how to run a business really effectively and look for signs of quality there other than the existing signs of quality, which tend to be around research and knowledge generation. Now, the current accreditation bodies globally are pretty good, actually, at, at uh, helping schools to be mission-focused. So they are making some space for that, but I think we need to take it an order of magnitude further to say what we're really looking for is quality facilitators of the application of global best practice, whatever you want to call it, in, in business to your local, not only just your local country, but your local industry and your local company, what you're doing as a business per person. And I think there's a really interesting scope for defining quality in that way, which would be applicable in many places around the world. And we've got many models. I mean, if you look just at Asia, which you know more about than I do, Howard, but uh, Singapore really absorbed the sort of Western, largely American style of management education and did it very well, sometimes better than those that learned it from. Mm. Go across to India, who, who, who are the, in the institutes of management are, e are excellent, but they've put an Indian flavor to the academic pursuits there. Go on to um, Japan, where they didn't even bother to have business schools and did very well. Their, their peak growth area was largely without business schools. So we can really absorb from all over the place. And China, well, who knows what they're going to teach us about management education. So I don't think we need to follow any particular model. We can create our own. Lovely. Joan. I'm going to ask you maybe to conclude. I just can't read the lady next to you her name because Jonathan is larger than life. <laughs> so you're going to have to speak on her behalf. Um, so w before I, I tell you which question I'd like you to reflect on, in fact, maybe uh, I will tell you which question I'd like you to reflect on, is maybe building on exactly what Jonathan is talking about, which is um, given that there's such diversity of models out there, in different countries, in different, both between the African context and the Asian context. Uh, what are some of those models that we need to think about? Maybe at a granular, practical level, what should we be focusing on? And so whilst you're thinking about that, let me reflect a comment on screen, one of the comments by Paul Carlyle, uh, who says that, my experience with teaching North American millennials is that they can access the best content from anywhere but what they crave is to wrestle with real problems. We need to create problems for them. Um, so I'm not so sure it's whether we're creating problems for them, i.e. the North American millennials that I want to respond to, but more to say it seems as, as, a, as a teacher in an African context, myself, for example, I know we're not, we are not short of real problems that students can wrestle with. 
and possibly be able to build onto that, Jonathan, this notion that we need to highlight and amplify these real problems as a source of strength to say, uh, Udo, if you want to do exchange programs between schools on the African continent, across schools, between African uh, business schools and non-African business schools, come to us to wrestle with the real problems on an exchange basis. So you can come and learn and test some of your concepts, whether they're Asian concepts or Western concepts, in a real life problem that is not manufactured, that is there, that's live, and we can facilitate that for you and make that your experience as a rich experience. So that's possibly another area of strength that we could build off and that we have underestimated. So, so thank you for that, uh, Paul. Um, and I'll come back to some of the comments that you're making, Paul. Let's give John an opportunity. John, John says she's all mixed out for the evening. Uh, Tracy, you want to give it a go? Uh, no? <laughs> all right. So po possibly, um, if I may ask you, Howard, um, um, to reflect on the point that Jonathan is reflecting on, which is what models of management education, other than North American and European, can African schools learn from? Jonathan has obviously mentioned a few of them, and, and I, I wonder if, if you want to build on that point. Well, I sort of agree with his general point, which is that build your own, but you know, take the best from them as well. I mean, you know, it seems to me that if you go back to the answers that we had from the, uh, the, the um, respondents we talked to, I mean, it's very clear that they believe in contextualization and adaptation. Well, th those seem to me to suggest the contextualization part is what is African, and the, uh, the adaptation is taking the best bits from other places, which are either universal contra constructs or close to universal contra constructs, and uh, amending the others. I mean, I would, I would regard some of the things that are important in an African context I go back to questions of development finance, of economic development. I mean, I, I'm not an economist, but I've learned a lot about economic development uh, in my, my own work on, you know, over the last two, three years on social and financial inclusion. I mean, I've met a lot of people from the World Bank. I've lot of met a lot of people from uh, social impact firms, uh, you know, and in many ways, you know, that sort of um, environment, the social venture funds, the social impact funds uh, that, uh, you know, do help uh, facilitate growth in uh, underdeveloped areas. I mean, I could give you any number of examples, water plants in Cambodia, uh, you know, fishing investments in the Philippines. I mean, it's, it's legion. Uh, but I think that, you know, the, the basic element is that there are parts of that curriculum that should be African. The case, there should be more African case studies. There should be more um, push amongst economists to have a free trade zone across Africa. I mean, it's entirely frustrating. I mean, it sure must be frustrating for you guys. But when you come from abroad, if you don't have a visa, you know, you don't get in. Uh, or you pay and you get in. Um, but, you know, visa-free trade would be a tremendous advantage for, for Africa. And I think, you know, continually studying uh, the lessons of where interregional trade has grown in other continents would be equivalently important here. So, but I'm with Jonathan. I do not think there is an African model any more than I think there's an European model, an American model, an Asian model. And to answer your question, what are the Chinese doing? trying to beat the Americans at their own game. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I showed up some statistics yesterday which I'm willing to share with you because you made the point about Japan as well. Um, amongst, uh, there are a, a large number of MBA schools in China, but there are 55 accreditations across the three main accreditation boards in China. In Japan, there are four four in Japan, which has been one of the most innovative uh, countries, uh, you know, since the Second World War, in any case. I mean, it's had its peaks and troughs, but nevertheless, it's been pretty innovative. 
engineering culture, very few business schools. And the Germans were late to the business school game as well. If you compare the Germans and the Northern Europeans with the Western Europeans, they're miles behind. But why? Because the culture and the context was very much more uh, engineering, uh, functional, and you, know, you could go through all sorts of reasons. And you know, one of the really interesting innovations that happened in, in um, Finland, for example, was the merger of three institutions in in Helsinki to form the Alto School, which is a multidisciplinary school, which was the former Helsinki School of Economics, the Helsinki School of Design, I forgot what the other one was. It's jolly interesting. These are the sorts of things that could occur in Africa very easily. You could see schools collaborating within a, uh, a geographical area rather than saying, I'm going to compete with Strathmore or Lagos. Why not three uh, um, you know, institutions of different uh, uh, varieties uh, working to develop management education here. So I'm more or less in, in, in Jonathan's camp. I, you know, and then my argument would be put simply across geographies, across cultures, contexts, um, there is no single management model anywhere. That the, and that the institution should try and do what it does best and in some cases, if it's a, a, na a regional champion or a national champion, that's great. That you do need role models as well. It cannot just be, you know, local or regional schools. You need a range of schools to satisfy, you know, the huge needs in the African continent, which, you know, Jonathan's AMI report uh, mapped out. I've continued to do work as a few other people have, McKinsey Global Institute and a few other people, but it's more or less the same story. And Tammy's come up with a new one, I yeah, think. Yeah, we, we don't mention that word in South Africa uh, easily anyway, uh, McKinsey. Oh, you don't? Uh, uh, I say, well, <laughs> right, right at the moment, I think <laughs> I understand why. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, that was a joke. Uh, um, if I may ask you possibly to reflect very briefly before we go back to uh, some of the comments online, uh, you did touch on this point earlier, which was on the faculty model that you at SMU um, um, were part of developing. Um, to what extent, um, I just really want to possibly rephrase this question, given that you already touched on it. To what extent are, um, at the risk of being too accreditation focused, are the accreditation bodies uh, interested in and, and supportive of different faculty models? Um, I think increasingly they have been. Uh, those of you who've watched the last set of standards for AACSB will see that they've defined faculty in four categories. I and mean, I've forgotten exactly the categories, but they largely break down between scholarly and applied and um, you know, um, um, you know, doctorally trained and not doctorally trained. It's, it's something like that. But they have four categories. That's not that different from what we have done in terms of, you know, um, education professors, practice professors, uh, tenure track professors who want to publish in the A journals. Um, and, um, you know, so AACSB have done that. I would say that EFMD, which is the other major accreditation body, and I still sit on their board, are much more flexible in terms of looking at what a school does. And I noticed Tammy had a, a quote down there a moment ago. But I think um, the, w the fact that they have um, focused on mission-driven, in other words, you have to say what the heck you're doing. You know, you can't start off by developing a business school and say, I have no interest in developing people for business. You know, we all have a mission or a vision. This is it. Tammy says, it's good if we look at African business schools that are mission driven. Their mission is defined to serve their stakeholders. We are able to define standards and apply them to our diverse contexts. Now, I think that's a good summary of what I was trying to say before. I saw it flashed up, <laughs> but I'd, you know, I didn't copy it in my answer, I swear. <laughs> this, uh, this was not a... Uh, an uh, unethical form of cheating in an answer. But uh, I largely agree with what he's saying. Both accreditation bodies have gone to mission-driven. 
for some time. I mean, AACSB went before the last standards, and EFMD have always had it. The one thing that differentiates EFMD, or two things that differentiate EFMD from uh, um, AACSB, are one, a mo very much stronger focus on internationalization uh, with EFMD, and secondly, a very much stronger focus on executive education and the practical forms of education. So in some ways, you know, the accreditation organizations are changing. Um, are they changing in ways that, mm, you know, make sense for the, the, the great body or the great rump of institutions in Africa? I would say no. I mean, but for national champions and for regional champions, they may be aspirational. What uh, AABS is trying to do is much more relevant to the greater rump of schools in the context of Africa in a developmental sense. Wonderful. So I'd like to give uh, anyone else a last uh, opportunity to make closing remarks. And then before I ask uh, our esteemed guests and host, co-host to close out the jam for us. Any last comments? Udo. Right. Thank you. Um, I just want to go back to the Africa management module again. Um, mm. <clears throat> Professor Howard Thomas, I know that you've mentioned that there is no um, distinctive African model or European model, um, but is it a worthwhile um, endeavor to kind of look into it, especially in the light of conversations that are taking place in South Africa regarding decolonized education? Is it something that is worth you know, considering and, and looking at it and kind of finding something that really relate to, to an African context. Um, from where I'm sitting and, and the little experience that I have, I also don't believe that there is different models. You, you actually have various adaptations and contextualization of, of the various uh, management education that you have. Mm. You know, I, you know I, I can agree with most of what you said. I mean, Getting the context right is important, but you have 54 different African countries too. So the context, so when you're talking about an African management model, the question you would ask is, what is Africa? You know, that's a reasonable question. Any more than what is Asia? And Asia is a hell of a lot of countries that would differ quite widely in, in a lo lots of ways they do things. Um, different religions, different languages, different cultures, you know, go down the line. But adapting uh, management educational models to context and to what differentiates those countries, I say yes. I think there are general elements that I talked about before which have to do with economic development and, and uh, development finance. And I think the whole sense of community that exists in Africa and Asia, which are things that the West could very well learn. Won't be a bad idea. You know, I mean, uh, you know, you know, helping people is not a bad idea, actually, you know, when you think about it. Um, you know, taking responsibility for things is not a bad idea, rather than saying, what the hell? So, you know, in some ways, I have some sympathy with what you're saying, but I don't think there, I there, is, there is or ever will be an African management model, any more so than there is an European management model or an American management model. There will be a range of models in each of those uh, uh, continents which reflect the different traditions, cultures, contexts, and so on and so forth that exist. Not all American states are the same. Don't forget, America had a civil war, you know, <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, started off with, you know, you, goodness knows what, the South against the North, and you know, you can still see symbols of the, of the South, in various plates in the United States. Just look at the um, situation in Charlottesville not long ago. So, you know, this isn't a perfect world, but I think the desire for Africans to improve that this continent is is laudable, remarkable, and should be encouraged. That there should be a range of management education models that fit 
the different characteristics and environments that exist in Africa, I agree with. But I don't think there can be one African management education model. So, I mean, I think you're looking to me to say something at the end. Um, all perhaps, I was perhaps you do before you do that, I could make a contribution. Oh, to that sure, point. please. Um, please. You know, uh, th my my response may well resonate with some uh, of the delegates that like theory in conversation. Um, and so I, I, I'll take it till to a theory called institutional theory. And institutional theory, what, one of the things that we learn from it is that uh, institutions are quite resilient. And, and there's a term that you used earlier. And they're also quite isomorphic, which means they're quite similar. So if you think of hospitals anywhere in the world, they're quite similar. If you think of police stations as in institutions anywhere in the world, they're quite similar. There's a part where you have to lock people up and the part where you have to book them and so forth. So similarly, if you think of educational institutions like ours, a business school, they're quite similar all over the world. So in essence, business education is quite similar all over the world. What may well be different are those three C's <laughs> that uh, your wife uh, taught us about through you, Howard, the C's of context, culture, and country. And that's where you need to take all those similar things and say, how do we make them relevant to our context, relevant to our culture, and relevant to our country in a way that is engaging between business government, civil society, and management educators like ourselves in a way that has impact. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's my contribution. And uh, Well, I have to say that he's proven himself <laughs> uh, to be a far better summarizer and a far better uh, presenter than I could ever wish to be. So, you know, I, I, want, to, I want to offer my thanks to you I also noticed Tammy's just say, um, just made a point here that I just want to read out. He said, thanks, Howard. It's time to catch my flight for Joburg. He's coming to the CAFMD <laughs> conference. Great moment. Looking forward to learning more from colleagues. All the best. Now, the point I want to pick up is looking forward to learning more from colleagues. This is um, a, d a debate that's going online through the end of November. Those of you who are uh, joining this online, I would encourage you to continue offering comments, continuing this debate. Um, those of you who come here today, uh, we're tremendously grateful. It's, uh, and we're grateful to Gibbs for you know, taking the risk. Um, a risk has its own reward, and uh, I can see that uh, people around here have gained a fair bit from this. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very, very pleased that Gibbs is the pioneer in doing this. But the ones that we're going to do over the course of 2018 will lead to, hopefully, an exchange of ideas which will, you know, enliven what we're doing, uh, give us some other insights. Yeah, there's no answer to any of, the, any of these things completely. Um, at some point in time, I, like every good ballerina, I'll have to leave the stage because, uh, you know, uh, despite prosthetic limbs or whatever it is that I, <laughs> I will be able to survive with, I am hoping that many of you take on the, the task of pushing this thing forward so that uh, the success is achieved, not just on the African continent but elsewhere in making management education a, a, a driving force for economic change and economic development. So thank you all. Thanks to everybody. You guys who've been uh, manfully uh, uh, recording this. Thank you. And for the microphone, apparently I said some things uh, that I shouldn't have said <laughs> <laughs> that have probably gone on the tape, <laughs> which will be very interesting when I see it again. <laughs> but never mind. Uh, thank you all so much, and uh, thanks to Gibbs. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Namaste. Thank you very much, and uh, long may the conversation continue. <laughs>